Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV's podcast 476. It's me, Disc Golf Guy, joined alongside Johnny V. I'm here. Again. As always. Season's over. We can relax now. Live, large live <laughs> scale productions of elite series events are over. Yes. Somebody else said to me today, oh, the season's over. I'm thinking, no, it's not. The season is over. This, the the, 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 the this main tour season is over. The that main large scale tournament season stops. is over. Yes, that's very true. As uh, tickets were recently booked for Las Vegas. Uh, oh, spoiler! There's uh, some new news. I'll be at the Halloween Classic out in Las Vegas next weekend. What? Uh, you know the Cho Chain Hawk Open. Uh, I'm, I'll be going back to that, and then of course we're already starting to look into stuff for next year as well so yes very much far from a completed season but the large scale egpt elite series and majors have officially concluded speaking of a completed season do you know who completed his season just two days ago with a big fat forty thousand dollar check nate saxton Oh, maybe. I don't know. Did you buy that many <laughs> Firebirds, uh, Firebirds no. when you were no, with him? I ain't got time no. for that. This guy would rather have a felon in his hand anyway. As you're saying, Ricky Waisaki joining us, our champion from this weekend. Rick, three-time Disc Golf Pro Tour championship winner. You, you just show up for the big checks? Ricky doesn't get out of bed unless it's for forty grand or what? <laughs> I guess so. That's, that's, that's the new thing. <laughs> I, not a bad reason to do so. So just so everyone's aware, we got Ricky. He is on the road uh, making a long haul. Almost home. Yeah. I saw your tweet earlier today saying you only had six hours to go. That had to be like at least four hours to go. So you're two hours out. Did you get lost? Yeah, we're running something like that. Hopefully we don't go through the desert and lose, lose, lose signal here soon. But yeah, we started the 31-hour journey on Monday. And uh, we drove through the night, and so I'm a little tired. So if, if I look tired or glossy-eyed, that's just uh, lack of sleep. That's all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounds like a disc I mean, for lining up excuses. Being tired on a podcast. <laughs> and you're driving, right? You're driving? No. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. No, I'm not personally driving. I'm in the car, though. <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, that's good. I don't so, have a Tesla that's auto drive yet. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. I mean, you just swung. The, I mean, you had it ready at the dealership on Monday. You're like, hey, I'm going to bring cash by. You guys cool with that? No, I've got this big giant check. Giant check. Yeah, you, got... you cash giant checks. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, so, Rick, uh, first of all, of course, congratulations. Um, I mean, let's start with the idea that your season in general was obviously abbreviated. And, you know, you came in and then it almost was what felt like maybe premature. You came in and then you weren't quite ready to go again. And, and I think you had to withdraw from an event. And then you got fired back up. What, how will you look back at this season in terms of, you know, kind of the crazy start and, and maybe even the crazier finish? Yeah, I mean, as an athlete and, you know, in this game and, you know, the wear and tear that you put on your body, there's... There's going to be events that you play, you know, play your best and feel your best, and there's going to be events that you're just kind of trying to grind through, grind through whether it's, you know, you're not feeling good, your arm hurts, whatever it may be, your, you know, confidence is shot. There's so many variables that go into playing at a high level, uh, and and that's why you see some players, some weeks they have it, some weeks they don't, and that's just the game of golf. I mean, that's there's so many moving parts that have to come together for you to be able to play well, and. Um, it even goes for a whole season, not just a week in and week out thing. It could be a yearly basis where, you know, it just so happens you get injured, you know, multiple times in a season and you don't have, you don't play as many events as you wanted and the events that you do play, you just don't feel 100%. So that's kind of where I felt like I was this year. Um, just, you know, and that's, like I said, that's kind of the nature of the beast when you're, when you're, when you practice as much as we do on tour, uh, we're, we're driving, we're, we're throwing a ton of shots and, you know, obviously we're doing as much as we can to, to mitigate the damage but just like just like they always say you know if, if you're throwing just like a, like a baseball pitcher you know they're they're just basically just bound to have tommy john surgery it's just, just a matter of when you know you can take care of and work out stretch as much as you can but that repetitive motion is, is going to take its toll eventually yeah i mean even for an abbreviated season you still had 17 finished events you you started 18 as terry said but you had to withdraw from the open at austin um but 17 events is still a pretty solid season that's a lot of events uh, starting in, yeah. what, I think, late April. 
Yeah, yeah. So yeah, obviously, you know, I was I, I wanted to play the start and I wanted to play against all events. I enjoy playing and they're events to open up the season. They're obviously, you know, events you want to come out and play well, get some points, and you know, have a chance to win out with those. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's just you know, it's you know, I think next year I might I might skip a couple tournaments in the beginning of the season just to be able to even if I'm am healthy, just to kind of just to kind of pr- uh, make sure that I'm healthy for. You know the three fourths of the of the events that I want to play, like you know Waco, and um, you know obviously the season being so as long as it is la- next year, there's a lot of ter- you know a lot of events. You know obviously I'm not going to play them all, and um, so yeah, I think I'm probably going to skip a couple of the events in the beginning of the season just so I can extend my off season and uh, do a little more training. Um, yeah, working out a little more uh, body work. Well, and that kind of brings us, I mean, we'll, I'm sure we'll get around to a lot of different things, but next season, the season is very backloaded with majors and huge events. What are you going to do next year in order to make sure that you are in, we'll say, peak athletic form for yourself, all things considered with uh, with you and the Lyme disease, but, you know, which is always a coin flip, it feels like, assuming that you're, you know, with your health, but what are you going to do to make sure that you are in your best form at the end of the season? Yeah, I mean... For me, I think it's like I said. That's part of it. It's just to kind of taking the beginning couple tournaments off. Like in Florida, I'll probably end up skipping those. I'll go to the All Stars. That's kind of more of a fun event. Just to, you know, icebreaker to the season. You know, go hang out with everybody. You know, people will probably be switching sponsors. Talking, you know, talking about that. Talking shop. Just you know, just just a fun event to to kind of get the season started. So I'll probably play that. It's not like a it's not like an event where I'm going to go grind four days before the event and practice all day every day to get ready. It's just, you know, you fly in for a couple days, hang out, throw some shots, and, you know, and then fly out. It's not, like, super grueling. So I'll play that, and then and then I'll probably skip a couple of the Florida events. Uh, just like I said, what you said, Johnny, just because, you know, the, a lot of the bigger events are in the, you know, second half of the season. If you cut the season in half, um, the second half is where all the big events are. And obviously there's a lot of big events in the – the first half as well, like Waco's uh, is now an elite plus, so that's early in the season for that to be a big event. So I'll definitely, I'll probably, I'm definitely gonna play that. Um, but it's not gonna be the, you know, every week, you know, like like it was towards the end of this end of this year, where you had Maple Hill, you had Worlds, you had USDGC, then the Pro Tour Finals. It was just like almost like six events in eight weeks. It seemed like. Uh, so I won't be doing that in the beginning of the season. I'll kind of save that tour for the second half. And, and I think it, you've seen it with a lot of people at the Pro Tour Finals, and I'm not going to mention any names, but you can kind of you can kind of watch someone play and see that, like, all right, they're a little mentally not there. <laughs> they're <laughs> mentally not themselves. People kind of, you know, were just, you know, burned out. It's that's You know, you hear that word used a lot, but, I mean, when you play this many events and uh, the off season's right around the corner, it's easy to look look past the event and just be like, oh, I want to go home and just see my family or do whatever to take your mind off of the, off the sport that you've been grinding on for the, you know, eight months. So, um, I want to try to avoid that as much as I can, the mental burnout. Yeah. And, and I mean, we can say one of the names only because he very openly said it himself. Mason Ford posted today and said, Hey guys, you know, I made the finals. I'm super happy about my play, but I also am kind of mentally over it. I I was ready to go home. I wasn't all there and I was ready to get back to Texas or or get back with his family and start the off season. And, And that's no slight to him. I mean, he's been grinding just like everyone else out there. And to, to say that there's not much left in the tank, I don't think is a disrespect to anyone. And, and I, I really applaud Mason in that not only did he realize it within, within his, his, himself, but he then shared it with the world. And uh, I again, I hold no, no uh, ill will or chip on the shoulder over that. I, it, it makes I think, perfect sense. I think that's a learning experience for him. He knows now next yeah. year he's going to have to do something inside himself in order to be able to compete at the end of the season. Because as we said, with Champions Cup moving to the end of the season, you have to be mentally ready because there's three majors within like a month and a half. And if you're not in it, what's the, I hate, I hate to say what's the point of the season, but like if you're not right. there to compete for the majors, man, like yeah. that's just, that's gotta yeah. be tough. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And it's, it's like going to the grocery store when you're, when you're super hungry, you go to the grocery store, you're like, Oh, you know, I want to, <laughs> I want to buy everything and eat everything. And then you get home and you eat it like a little bit and you're like, Oh, I got way too much stuff. <laughs> I mean, I think that's kind of how it is when you make your season, your your off season, you're you're in the off season making your schedule, 
and you want to play all these cool events and you're like, oh, I want to play Vegas. I want to play Waco. I want to play Jonesboro. I want to put all these events because they're fun and, you know, but then you get to the end of the season and you're just like what Mason probably happened with him. His eyes were bigger than his stomach when it comes to all the tournaments <laughs> that he wanted to play. You know, like he's like wanting to play all these events, but then you get to the, you know, the pro tour finals. He made the finals and I'm sure he was pumped about that, but he just, he tried to tap into some, you know, mental stamina that just wasn't there because he, you know, he just kind of, you know, like you said, drained the mental well in, in previous tournaments. So I think this building, the, the building your schedule part is going to be super important for people. And um, like I said, I think that, and the other thing is everyone's at a different stage in their career. Some players are in the stage where they, they want to play every event. They want to build their brand and, and, uh, and, 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 I, and that's, you know, I was at that stage at some point in my career. And I totally respect that. Um, it's just, you know, it's just whatever you can handle, whatever you want to, and, and I think Mason's going to probably make an adjustment now. Like, hey, all right, that didn't work last year. Let's uh, let's tone it down a little bit before these big events so that way I can at least feel fresh and, and, and mentally be there uh, for every event that I play. How many uh, – there, there's a, a very open communication that happens with our players and the Pro Tour. There's uh, – I know there's at least a Facebook group and then other forms of communication – do you personally or did you personally chime in at all when it came to scheduling conversations? You know, do, did you have an opinion about starting in the West, you know, with with the All-Stars and the uh, Las Vegas Challenge uh, or, or just anything? Did you give personally any input about, you know, some of the things you like or dislike about our tour schedule? No, I didn't. I didn't have a chance to. I was talking to Yuli about it. I think he's on the on the players board. I was staying with him for USDGC in the Pro Tour Finals, so mm -hmm. I was talking to him a little bit about it. Um, I think that um, it's it's kind of turning into. It seems like it's like the PGA. You'll have certain big events that are almost every year going to have the big names every year are going to go to that event, and then the other events are going to be. You know, there'll be still be big names and people trying to get some wins that are that are big names but it'll also be you know s spread out you know you're not going to see all the big names at every event you know let's say me and eagle and kyle and gannon might be at one event and then the next event it'll you know or maybe it's isaac maddie o and you know a couple other of the top players there and we're taking a week off so i think it's good for the spectators like that i think that you know that that you know allows the spectators to have some high level play that they can watch week in and week out while the top players can also still get their break that they need uh, to come back and play at, at the highest level that they, you know, feel like they can. Um, and I think for, for and looking at the schedule for, to expand on what you're asking, Terry, the, the schedule next year, it seems pretty long. Like, I think, because we're going from DGPT Pro Tour Finals to the Champions Cup, and that takes us almost to, like, November 5th or something like that, November mm -hmm. 6th. And, and then next thing you know, you know, you're not getting home if you, you know, if you have to take a you know flight or whatever or drive, you're not getting home till middle of November almost, and then you know you're already having to turn around. And if you're you know in the All Star event, you're you know beginning of January, you're already having to play. You know, so it's it just seems like a short turnaround as far as you know you know a lot of people they need that break, they need some time to to do some strength training, you need some time to regroup, to have some family time for people that have been gone for nine months and and. Um, I get it. We're all professionals and we all, you know, we'll all adapt. Um, but also, you know, that's kind of just the stuff that we think about that um, would fully optimize our off season and being able to get a month to just chill. And, and maybe, you know, for the people that want to grind and practice all the time, they can they can do that. But then the people also that want to chill and regroup and recover their body and let their body recover, um, they can do that. They can, you know, time to work out. And uh, cause, I mean, most sports, they have, you know, at least four to five months off season uh, and that's you know not I guess not most sports I guess but a lot like like baseball you look they finish in you know October late October early November and you know they're they're not picking back up until when's when's the first when's the first game of baseball like like late, mid March late or March, April early April yeah okay yeah. okay so so yeah it's it's a it's a lot longer than disc golf I mean disc golf for middle middle April middle October end October and then you know a lot of times we're February 14th. We're already tr thinking about the All Stars in Vegas, you know. So it's, um, sure. but I, but yeah, that's kind of just you know from my point of view. So I guess that'll before we start talking about the uh, the Tour Championship, I guess I'll ask what your off season now is going to look like. How are you going to recoup this off season? What are you going to do? 
are, are you going to, I know last year you took a trip, I think, to Mexico, hung out there yeah. in the off season. Yep. What does your off season look like? When are you going to start, um, when are you going to start grinding again, I guess? When are you going to start, like, get the putters out and really start, you know, all right, I need to, you know, I, I need to dial this in before I, uh, before I make my first appearance. Yeah. So, so for me, I, I actually read a book one time about like, about top professional athletes and I kind of took a page out of the book. I guess that's a good analogy. Um, did you but, return uh, the book to the library I, without a yeah, page? Yeah, like a ripped out page. <laughs> it's like, it's in his bag all folded up between two minis. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Oh, I think, I think, I think oh, Ricky sorry. locked up a little bit. Oh, there he is. You're back. No, don't worry about it. You're back. <laughs> yeah, you're what good. You uh, okay. we, we asked if you literally took the page out of the book and then, you know, put it in, possibly in your bag or something. <laughs> yeah, I did. So I remembered what I was reading, you know. <laughs> um, but anyways, it was – and, I, and it's, I guess it's kind of a stupid story, but it was, I, for, I actually forget the athlete, but it, I remembered the, what, what, they're, what they did in the off season, and it was like a high-level athlete – that actually obviously trained a bunch and had went through a really rough, not rough season, but like a grueling season. And then they went through a month stretch where they basically, they, I, I want to say it was like Michael Phelps or someone like super high level Olympian athlete like that, that like ate McDonald's and like just did this let loose um, in, in those moments. And then kind of just let their, you know, like we were talking about their mental, their mental well, so to say, build back up. And if it's Michael Phelps, let that, you know, let his fire for swimming kind of come back after, you know, whereas obviously at the end of the season, it can kind of feel like you're going through the motion. And so if you take some time off, whether it's eating McDonald's or going for a hike or, you know, Mexico and just hanging out for a week, um, that kind of stuff just allows you to kind of just build up that fire back slowly. And then, you know, you take that month off and then by the end of that month, you're like, all right, sweet, I want to get back. I have that fire to play again. And that passion kind of comes through again to where that passion kind of dies off a little bit. I'm not going to go on, but like what Mason Ford's going through, that is a completely normal thing for a top professional player. That's nothing That's nothing just specific to him. And so I can totally relate to him on, on what, what he went through. Uh, but I think that just the fact that taking that month off, not doing, not doing much, chilling, watching football, whatever your other hobbies are, that's important to go ahead and do those and, uh, and slowly build that fire back to then once you're back and ready, and your fire's back, you can start working out, start putting, start going to the field. Um, so for me, that's kind of my formula to building that that mental well back up. And you're headed back to Arizona, right? All the way across country. You have an, uh, a place somewhere in the Scottsdale area or, or northern Scottsdale? Yep. And uh -huh. yep. Uh, you, clearly, there's a lot of people that have been finding better weather, whether that's Florida or or texas or california or arizona those have become kind of the the logical places we're seeing more and more players kind of migrate to during the off season for a lot of obvious reasons do you have uh, I, I was just gonna flat out just say roommates do you have planned extended visitors what's what's kind of going on at your house and and can i stay there for a few days yeah. in uh in november <laughs> <laughs> definitely dude yeah okay. you're always welcome yeah you yes. can um <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, no problem. You can definitely stay there. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I'll have like Bradley, I'm friends with Bradley. He'll, I was talking to him. He wants to come out in the off season and do some training together, together. Gannon, uh, I'm friends with Gannon. He stayed at my place last year for the Memorial. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think he's going to come out and hang out. So I like to, AB lives like 10 minutes away. So we'll be hanging out and, uh, you know, watching the D backs game. That playing right now to them uh so we're gonna have a little watch party at my house once once they start playing and uh, but, but uh yeah so i definitely have people over and i like to have buddies that we can kind of push each other play money rounds in the off season get that competitive disc golf those competitive disc golf juices flowing hey we're gonna play for 50 bucks today you know and get mm -hmm. three or four of our touring buddies to uh, uh to, to get together and, and play and, and it also it's and, it, and also it's fun it kind of just like goes back to the roots of you know, just going out with your buddies and playing disc golf. And, you know, we're out here in Arizona. It's 70 degrees. You get to play Fountain Hills. And it's not, you're not, you're not, you're not really grinding. You're just kind of, you know, getting back into it. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's something that I'm, that I'm super pumped about being able to, to host people. And, you know, I've always, I've always found off
season spots where weather said that kind of host the couch surfers now and give give people a place to stay. I'm very thankful. Yeah, you got a little choppy, but I think the long and short of it is, yeah, you've you've taken advantage of crashing with a few people uh, in those nicer climates, and now the fact that you're, uh, well, you're big time. Let's let's be real here. You're big time, so now you have a house that you can reciprocate, and uh, that's awesome to see. And I know a lot of players talk about finding a way to visit and or just take advantage of the nice weather throughout, which is great. You still with us? Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we can. You're getting a little little desert choppy. It's not it's not the worst, but we'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when when Rick comes back, we'll maybe we'll cut our video feed to him to hopefully help that out. Hey, Rick, welcome okay. back. There you go. Okay. Hey. Yeah. So. Uh, if we back up and get into a few details of this weekend, I, I, I guess one of just the first questions I would say is. If if they told you, if they being the, the pro tour said, hey, we're going to play the championship at Nevin for the next five years. We're gonna we're thinking about locking in a five year contract, and I'm just making this up by the way. But they said we're gonna play there for the next five years for the championship. Would you like that? Or would you like to see it rotate or or other courses or other configurations? <laughs> but just generally speaking, would you wanna be at Nevin? Yeah, I mean, come on! I went back to back. I love that place. <laughs> um, no, I, I do. I do like the course. I think it's a it's a it's a great course. It's you know it's got a good. I, I think with the two extra finishing holes, more than that, they add a little bit more uh, wooded because it's pretty much all wooded, minus minus like the 17 and 18. Those mm -hmm. are the two holes you can kind of like, and they've had so much out of bounds. It's not every shot is you know you have to pay attention to the wind pay attention to how your disc is landing and just all the different variables um and i think it's good for the spectators it seemed like the it was they had a good viewpoint from a lot of different holes they did a lot of clearing of the trees on like not near the fairways but like on the on the where the spectators can see through obviously super important um so yeah, I would. I, I like that course. Um, I think I, I like I like when we can get um, get courses like, like USDGC and events like USDGC where you create this, um, uh, I guess, classic. You know, like I don't know what the word is for it, but like going back to the same course where you can develop course records. People, mm. you know, remember things from circles instead of just switching it up all the time. You know, I think that you know in, in golf you see like, hey, we're going back to St Andrews or whatever. And it just has all this history there. And so it's hard to create history if you just keep bouncing around to different courses. And, like, people, you know, if I have a cool shot this year and, like, that whole 16, that was I feel like that was a cool moment in the tournament. I hit that putt. Let's say next year, I don't know, whoever, let's, you know, Gannon Burr throw, throws an ace on, like, coming down the stretch of the tournament. Like, that's a moment people would remember, you know, down, you know, in five years, you know. And I think those kind of things are important to create history in the game. And I think that's – kind of we need more of that and i would like so i would like to see it stay for sure do you one of one of the and again i, I mean every ounce of praise that we give to charlotte and the club and everything they've been doing all these last few years but others have even noticed the the on-site spectatorship feels a little light is that a hundred percent a usdgc hangover you know and people just got done volunteering and spectating that um you know because the club is so strong the area is strong with an insane amount of golfers what why are we not seeing as many show up maybe to uh spectate in person that weekend do you have any guesses yeah i so i heard someone talking about how expensive the vip pass was like 800 bucks for the, oh. for the week i was like wow so and that included that was some sort of, i'm sure that was a vip pass it was like a gold pass where it included like you got to play the pro-am you got to do a couple extra per mm -hmm. perks but that was super expensive it could be that it also okay. could be the format you know where it's like you know the format's a little different so i think that could be throwing people off but also i do think it's a lot of a lot of hangover from USTGC because i was playing some local courses that, that i ran into some spectators were like oh yeah we're just 
we're just playing a course before we fly back home after the USDGC. So, like, there's spectators that flew in for the USDGC, and then they just flew out. Because, obviously, most people don't have two straight weeks to, you know, take off work. If they're, mm-hmm. if they're a disc golf spectator, they're obviously not – they're not making money playing disc golf, so they got to do it other way, other way, mm-hmm. other ways, you know. So, um, so yeah, I think that it was a lot of that. People come in, they go to USDGC, and then they leave. Um, and so I think that that's a big reason why we, we didn't quite see. And even if you're in Charlotte, I mean, two weeks for even if you're local, it's kind of a lot. Um, two weeks in a row. So I think that problem very potentially could be, you know, a problem in the future. And then I think there might be some reason to move it. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the pro tour is talking about that, but also, like I said, that was the first thing that came to my head is the passes were pretty expensive. Okay. And like I said, it could be, I could be wrong. It could just be the VIP pass that I heard someone talking about. Um, I'm not sure how much the actual just daily admission was, but, um, but yeah, that's. Yeah. And, and again, that's, you know, clearly, I mean, disc, uh, Charlotte is known as, is literally one of the, the best hotbeds in all of disc golf uh you know in terms of the play the courses the club so there's no disrespect there the you know the weather is great and everything else i just you you nailed it there's a lot of people that are that are probably partaking in one or the other and the usdgc has a longer standing history especially being 25 years this year and that's that's the event that and it's it's far more accessible in general yeah look at the amenities yeah yeah, that are that are there for it with the players area and the spectators and and just you know the village and everything like the pro tour isn't Mm -hmm. at that level yet and if it's it'll take time yeah and another thing i do uh want to add to it is my sister was um was actually she lives obviously in rock hill so it's only like 30 40 minute drive but she actually stayed home to watch it on DGN. So, I mean, that could be part of it too, is a lot more people are, the product's so good that it's actually, you know, it's like a win-lose type of thing. Like, you, if DGN's good enough, people don't want to go watch in person because they're like, all right, well, I can just, you know, how many times you said that? Like, you're like, oh, some people say it about sports. Like, I'd just rather watch it from my couch, you know? And like, so it's a little, it could be part of that. So it could be a multifaceted thing mm-hmm. to where, you know, the product is getting that much better to where people, you know, and also Nevin isn't the best spectator course. So it could have been like, because I know last year was pretty good. So it could have been the type of thing like, you know, hey, uh, you get to pay X amount of money to go stare at a bunch of trees and not see any angles on any shots that we're throwing. You know, like that that's very well, you know, could happen because there's a lot of crazy angles around corners with trees everywhere. And yeah, they, they did what they could, but it's still, there's trees all over that place and it's hard <laughs> to get an angle. And so, yeah, I mean, I honestly think that that's, also could be could be it because that's could be why people went last year but not this year yeah and and again we know they did a great job and they cleared i think it was three and a half acres worth of stuff they had all these hundreds of man hours so there's you know there's no disrespect being tossed around we're just trying to figure out why is that and and truth be told all of us disc golfers always say you know, we don't like to see wide open shots on golf courses. We want to see wooded shots. But then you go into the woods and you deal with more difficult signal and you deal with uh, uh, a more challenging spectator. in-person spectator. I mean, those are just some all of our, like, those are, that's the dichotomy there of open versus uh, wooded courses. You know, I think, I think this perfectly exemplifies that, which... Um, you know, we're going to continue to try and figure out as we move forward. Well, let's, I was gonna say, let's talk a little bit about the event itself. Yeah. Um, you started out as a four seed, which I, it means you had a few strokes to give in those first two rounds. At, at what point did you feel locked in? Like where just everything felt like it was clicking because those last two rounds, about halfway through that round, it kind of felt like the momentum was completely in your favor. You almost couldn't miss for a little bit what from your perspective how yeah. do you feel well let me just, let me, okay cool uh let me just start by saying that uh yeah i mean i like the format and i like the fact that you play all it makes it that much easier for the players that played well and accumulated points and those points then, you know, attributed to strokes. I like that. I think that's it, it rewards the consistent players all season long, and that's super important. Uh, but I also want to say that uh, 
the fact that you get strokes is a huge advantage. Like for people that are just sneaking in and like, let's say they didn't get top 10, let's say they just got 12 or, you know, they're, they're only one under versus or even Mm -hmm. instead of like me and Calvin again and all them are like four or five under six under, like that's a humongous difference. Um, like even, even like, even if it was flip flop, like if I was at one under, like in some, in the, let's say 12th to 20th place person was in, you know, had, was at five under, like that's a lot of, that's a lot of strokes at this level in the game. That's a lot. Um, and so that is, you know, a big advantage. And I think, you know, I think everybody made the finals that got strokes minus Simon. Um, but, um, I think especially the way that course scores, um, yeah, there's, there's just, you know, there's a lot of times when obviously you'll have the outliers. Like I played a really good round and Calvin played a really good round, the final round, but majority, a lot of times you're going to run into bad shots and bad holes. And a lot of people shoot very compact scores between, let's say if you're a top player, you're going to, a lot of people shoot between two and six under seven under. So like that, that, that's pretty jam packed with, as far as like not that much separation. It's hard to really, obviously you didn't really see the 12 unders like you do at some courses. So that, makes it that much harder to separate and gain strokes and if you're already down four strokes you know it's you're really having to press and i heard a lot of people like emerson uh talking how he just felt like he had to play super aggressive trying to have trying to catch the 12th place guy to get into that last spot into the finals and so um so i think that you know even if i was outside of the the person like it's outside of the top 10 getting strokes i would still like it because i think it just you know if you didn't, if you, there's, there's nothing to really complain about. If you didn't get top 10, you, you're obviously thankful that you made the, the, the chance, the opportunity to get into the finals, but you got to work hard and you got to play really well. Um, and there's a lot more room for error, uh, with the top, top players. Um, and there's a lot less pressure and that's huge out there. Less pressure. You're kind of playing freely. You have a couple strokes to work with. You know, if you have a bogey here or there, you're not really panicking to where if you bogey a couple holes and you, you know, let's say you're one or two over, and you know it's, it's hard to come back. You know you, you're having to shoot five, six, seven under, you know, to get back in the hunt and have a chance to, you know, to even catch anybody. Do do you feel like? And I know you. So basically, you just said that you like the format. You know, it somewhat favored you, of course, with your fourth place seed. Do you feel like the strokes that were awarded are the right amount, or should they tinker with those numbers anymore? Because um, you were given. How many strokes were you given as the fourth seed? Um, I was given four. Yeah, yeah, four. Okay. I, was, I was four under. Yep. So four, and then I think it was something like Calvin got six. He mm-hmm. was at six under. Five, I think it just went in order: six, five, and then I think it was four, four. Uh, yep. Those two, like fourth and fifth, were four under. So, um, so yeah, I think that, and then I was down to like I believe tenth place was like one under or something like that, and then everyone else after that was at even. Yeah, something um, like that. Yep. Um, so, so it basically turned into, you know, the top guys were basically, you know, obviously nothing's guaranteed, especially at Nebit. But like, what it seemed like it turned into is like, the guys that, that just creeped in at even, they were trying to catch the guys that one or two under. So there was a battle between them, you know, and and so it's like who's gonna sneak in? Like Adam ended up sneaking in, shot a really hot round, um, and snuck in barely. Uh, and I think that that was kind of the, the first day that was the battle to watch. It was, Hey, who's going to sneak in and give themselves a chance to go into this finals. And then from there it resets. Um, so it was kind of weird being, a, uh, being not obviously nothing's guaranteed. And, and, you know, I don't take anything for granted, but it did feel like we were just kind of like a walk in the park, like, Oh, you know, we're, you know, everything's fine. We're not really battling for anything. We're just kind of like paying attention to like, Hey, who's in 12th place. Who's in 13th place making a move. Like, we were watching that like paying attention like felt like all the cameras should be over there like paying attention to like hey what's this battle who's gonna who's gonna get in who's gonna be first out like there's a lot of storylines there uh, so that's what it felt like day one or day one and two is just um yeah who's gonna get in that 12th spot um so you're you're good with the amount of strokes that were handed out would, would you would you change that yeah, at sorry. all <laughs> I, I didn't mean to dodge your question on purpose no no all good <laughs> um yeah i i guess I, I guess I would have to think about it a little bit more. Um, I, th- I think I think it's good. I mean, it's just so when I first I didn't understand if the strokes were for the entire tournament, like. But uh, obviously, like it was just the first and second round. I, I didn't know this until 
you know, a couple, like a week or two before the actual tournament. Um, but I, yeah, I would like, I would just have to think about it a little bit more as far as the strokes and how much, um, yeah, I mean, basically what it does is like, if you get top four, you're, you're almost a shoe in to get into the finals, you know? Mm. And so that just, it puts a premium on, you know, getting those points and being top in the points in, in, um, which I've always been an advocate for. I think there should be yeah. some sort of also payout, you know, on that. But I guess that's, you know, that's another another topic. But um, but yeah, it just makes it makes the, you know, the season long points that much more exciting. Another storyline: who's going to make the top, you know, top four, and the, you know, and then you can do like, you know, stories like, all right, the top four have, you know, proceeded to make the finals, and you know, three out of the last four years, you know, everybody in the top four or whatever that kind of stuff. So it adds to the storylines as far as. DOS and you guys being able to talk about that kind of stuff. I think a lot of it might also depend on the course. Like Ricky was saying, with the score yeah. so compressed, you could almost make the argument where it was like, there wasn't a lot of excitement for the first two rounds because we kind of, everybody who was in the top made the top with the exception of um, Simon. And and mm -hmm. so, so there wasn't maybe a lot of drama. So maybe with Nevin, in particular, you could say, well, maybe let's not give Calvin six strokes. Let's instead give him four. Let's go like four, four, three, three, two, something weird like that. I mean, we could sit mm -hmm. and discuss this all day, but I think a lot of it, you're right, might depend on the course. If you want to see more excitement, you lower those scores a little mm -hmm. bit on a course like Nevin. But a course like Waco could be completely different where someone yep. could come yeah, out and no, shoot exactly, yeah. a 14 and somebody else could come out and shoot a six and it doesn't feel much different. From your round yeah i think i think the course could depend Sorry, a lot what, on that what'd you say at the end there i was gonna say it, it like i said if, if you went to like waco where the scores could be much more varied it would really depend on how how you would look at it and each course could be a little different but we could sit and make that discussion all day long honestly depending on the course who knows yeah unless it's like a unless it's like a preserve type course where it's just you know everyone's just you know, it's a birdie fest. Mm -hmm. You know, almost everybody's shooting. You know, eight to eight to fourteen, fifteen under. You know, those are the scores. Everyone's shredding it. Now, uh, speaking of shredding it, uh, there was so much emphasis uh, during the press conference where a lot of our players said anything under par is good, and then if pressed for a number, you know, four, three, four, five, six might be good. Double digits is essentially crazy. I mean, I feel like. A handful of people more or less said that. And then when it was all said and done, you end up, I think I think we counted, with 40 birdies, I think was the number. Maybe it was even more than that. But when it was all said and done, it didn't seem like getting the birdies. Well, you also liked a few double bogeys. But getting the birdies wasn't <laughs> a problem for you. Were you just playing those fairways and just playing so much better in order to capture all those birdies that you did? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, you know, it's a type of thing where you can always go into a tournament with a number in your head, but then, like, you know, you go through the round and you're like, all right, well, I got an opportunity to shoot way better. You're not going to just be like, oh, yeah, I only want to shoot six under. You know, we're greedy. <laughs> yeah. We want to shoot as good as you can and, like, set set yourself up. You know, so that's what I was thinking the first day when I – or the first round of the semifinals is I was shredding. And I'm like, all right, well, I want to, you know, 18. I could have laid up on 18. I'm like, nope, I got to, you know, I can't – can't let off the break. I gotta, I gotta keep birdie and, and set myself up for tomorrow, you know. So, so I think that just knowing that I have to be aggressive uh, out there is, you know, there's really, you can be, you know, off the tee. You wanna, you wanna think you're thinking birdie on every hole, basically. Um, it's, it's on the second and third shot is when you, when you basically have to say, all right, do I really want to be aggressive when I'm this far out of position? Um, and so I think that that's something that, you know, for me, as I the weekend went on the first the first round I got you know, whatever what was that three double bogeys in the front nine so <laughs> so I, I toned it down I didn't get I still got a couple do, double bogeys <laughs> sprinkled in here and there but I didn't get that many so I kind of learned my lesson the first day and didn't when I got out of position I just all right, all right I'm gonna get the bogey or the par whatever I can scrap together here and move on to the next hole knowing that I can post up ten birdies in a round you know and just just if I minimize and just grind out that par and save that par that's going to keep the momentum of the round going instead of going backwards and getting a bogey or double bogey. Um, but to go to your next, your, what you're saying, as far as the scoring, it's just when you see, when you play with people, you can kind of, you kind of gauge how, how everyone's playing the rounds. And when you see people playing, getting a lot of birdies, it kind of like, 
you know, you play it just like anything. You play to your level of competition, and then that next thing you know, you know, your whole card shooting six, seven, eight under, and you thought, you know, five under was a good round. And I think I said before the before going into the semifinals, thirteen to fourteen under was gonna probably be winner at winning the winning it all. And I was pretty close. I mean, yeah, that was I, I ended up shooting fifteen. Um, obviously, eighteen was situationally, and I, you know, I obviously could have made the thirty footer if I really needed to, if I was, you know, if it was any other situation than, <laughs> than that. But, um, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think I was, you know, one or two strokes off of what I predicted. Yeah, it was, it was incredible. You, you had 19 birdies in the first two rounds and then, or should I say the semifinals? And then during the finals, you ultimately had 21 birdies. And I just think there's a lot of people that if given the opportunity to take a bet and say that somebody would average 10 birdies around, they would take that bet and say that you could give us ten birdies, we'd still finish over par, Terry. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we take yeah. as many doubles as Rick, though. No, I mean, I, I, dude, I, you, I, I'd hold it to singles. I'd spread it out. Like yeah. a lot of single bogeys. <laughs> yeah, you and your double bogeys out there. Like this well, guy doesn't. If you were playing, if you're playing not to double bogey, Terry, I'm sure you you, you wouldn't be double bogey. But if you're playing the birdie, you might have a couple, you will have some double bogey. I guarantee you that. <laughs> yeah, my, my the governor on my on my uh, throws and abilities is a little different than yours, that's for sure. So yeah, it was it was crazy to see you through ten holes during that first round when you had three doubles. And the rest, you know, and then six birdies. We're like, what is this guy doing? Uh, it's just kind of all over the place. Trying to keep it even. Doesn't want to get too far ahead. Yeah. Just prove right. everybody he can get birdies. Yeah. He doesn't exactly. need them. Yeah, plenty of birdies yeah, out that, there. That round was really weird because I was because I did build some confidence. I'm like, all right, well, I am birding. Like, so there's something to take away from this. And obviously me, you know, I can make changes on the fly and I can, you know, adjust my game plan and just, you know. So the fact that I got all those double bogeys obviously wasn't a good thing. But I was like, all right, I can tone it down a little bit, not play so hyper aggressive when I'm out of position, and that's kind of what I did the last, you know, couple rounds. Once I learned my lesson after that, was there any hole, maybe from round one or two, was there any hole where you stepped up to it in rounds three or four, where you're like, hey, this didn't work. I'm gonna go with a different shot off the tee. Can you remember any time where you're like, yeah, time to change up the game plan? Let me think here. So there are different discs I throw, like you know, on like hole one actually. I was throwing, so I went, I went with a fairway driver on hole one, and I just blasted all the way through the gap and almost went ob long. And there's, <laughs> there's like a, there's like a, there's like a path down there. I was like, got all scared. I'm like, I don't want to hit this gap too good and throw it too good and go long. So then I, I downgraded to a mid range, and um, I kept landing short. So it was kind of like, you know, I. The fairway was too much and the mid range was too short, so I was like in between discs on that hole. So that kind of hole, and I was able to make up for it by making putts, um, but I just never got my. I didn't even get my disc inside the circle, and I, I think I got two, two or I got three birdies out of four, and I, I didn't even throw it inside the circle once <laughs> on that hole, and it wasn't even close to the circle. I was like way outside the circle. I was like 50 feet on all of them, 50 feet or further. Um, so yeah, that was kind of hole that I just kind of. You know, I did, driving wise, I didn't have it dialed in, but I hit the putt when I needed to on that hole. Yeah, those are big Rick problems for sure. Oh, I, I couldn't get inside the circle, so I just made from circle two. Yeah, that's what yeah. As one does. Yeah, that, that, that's one philosophy, I guess. Well, real quick, like because it was certainly one of the highlights in it, and talk about momentum and setting a tone, just the putt from the knee from way deep in circle two to open up the final round. Uh, Walk us through that just for a moment. Yeah, I mean, so obviously, you know, three strokes on paper is, you know, it's good to have a lead and it's great to play with a lead, but, you know, you got to you gotta keep the pedal to the metal. You got to, you know, as soon as you let off, you know, a player like Kyle can swoop in there and, and, and put some pressure on, which he did. Um, so in the beginning of the round like that, I just wanted to – I want to set a precedence. You know, I feel like I play with a lot of emotion. I play with – and so I use that to my advantage. I want to get the crowd into it, and I feel like that's when I play my best. And so I I made that putt and was just got like super excited because I knew it was going to, you know, kind of snowball me in the, in the right direction as far as getting that momentum started with the birdie. And um, and so that's kind of that's kind of how I how I looked at it. And you know, it was really cool to feed off the crowd after that. Well, I mean, at, we we heard from Brian Earhart at one point. He talked to Kyle and turned to Kyle and basically said and Kyle had said like, oh, Ricky's on his putt. I guess I'm playing for second. 
And this was like early in the, <laughs> that. That was after hole three. Yeah, that was early in the early in the the final round. Like, how does how does that make you feel? Just knowing that you've you've stepped on your competitors' uh, ability, like feeling that they can win. Like, is that is that what you're is that what you're shooting for? I mean, I would be. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, it's interesting to hear that because it's not what I'm going for. It's just that's kind of like the genuine. You know, that's the genuine expression that I have when I play, because I play with a lot of intensity. As everybody, I want me to be able to win. I, you know, I mix a lot of sports people like envision the shot under the pressure. Where, what do I want to do? And then when I do it, you know, I explode with my emotion, you know, the raptor leg and screaming and and all that stuff. And that's just the raw emotion. I'm it's not like I'm going out of my way to get everyone closer that way. It makes Kyle's happen. That's kind of a result of it, but that's just me playing my, you know, that's playing in my comfort zone and feeding off the crowd. I think that's where, where I excel. And I, you know, and emotions can be good, they can be bad, um, but when they're good, I feed off them in a great way. Um, and I think it definitely affects competitors in a negative way because if I have a 70 footer that I hit, the crowd's guy. Well, I have a twenty footer. This is I, this. <laughs> what am I supposed to do here? This, nobody's gonna clap for me. I should make this, but now I'm all nervous and all. The, everyone's still clapping and screaming. Um, so yeah, there is that. That you know, the whole big putt thing is definitely a real thing, um, and it just makes it that much harder. Yeah, and speaking of emotion, I mean, we see you out there, obviously feeding on that, and and similarly, as you say, you ride emotion. You can tell when you're when you're disappointed or you're pissed off. Like it's it's very clear, you know, when you're frustrated with yourself or the situation. Uh, where where do you where do you try to keep your limits? Because there's like off the rails in in any given direction like do you have kind of just still a window in which you're trying to maintain somewhat even with showing yeah, your emotions I mean, I think, yeah i mean i think i obviously i get frustrated and hold myself to a high standard um but um but in those moments what i really am looking for and i think that's another reason why i go back to the emotion and you know expressing my how i'm feeling is like i look for that moment even when if i'm playing bad whether it's like just a nice upshot or a, a, a putt that I can get super excited about that I like executed a shot that I wanted and it kind of like snowballs in a good direction instead of like the snowball in the bad direction where you doink a putt the next hole you hit a tree and then that can snowball in that direction so I try to flip that snowball effect and say all right I want to you know I'm just thinking like all right I need to make a good shot in this hole whether it's a good putt or a good forehand and then it starts the snowball and then I make one more good putt and then so then that kind of starts I look for that momentum starter when I'm in my bad funk um and then that kind of restarts my my uh, my momentum, and uh, so that's kind of what I think when I'm in a when I've got a downward spiral into a not so good emotional um, you know mindset. Yeah, and and sometimes that works, and sometimes you hide that very well. You can you can be throwing. Be really frustrated. Then you throw a perfect shot, and you still look disgusted, like you're ready, <laughs> like you're ready just to to shoot lasers through the basket or the trees, yeah. even though yeah. you just parked a hole. And and I understand. There's you, like you said, you hold yourself to a high level, and then there's an intensity that, you know, uh, when things aren't going your way, even when you do want to turn it around, a good shot doesn't always bring you out of that funk. But I can see yeah. how you're you're looking for it. Yeah, and sometimes it's like the. It's almost like the rage. The rage almost makes me like mm -hmm. obviously not all the time, but like, <laughs> but sometimes you get the rage, like the rage putt where you're like so mad, and you're like, oh, I'm making this thing. I'm so pissed off from the previous hole, or like that shot. Like I throw a drive, and I'm not pissed off about the drive because obviously, like deep down, I'm like, oh sweet, I pumped. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a birdie look, but I'm just like, kind of like I guess a little bit spill over from the previous hole because I just bogeyed it, and so I'm still pissed off from that. But I actually use that to like harness positive you know, a positive shot, like, all right, just kind of grit down and bear down and use that negative energy to, you know, uncork a shot, you know? Is there anything, um, is there any other big takeaways from this weekend that maybe fans at home didn't see or know, or, uh, you know, we kind of just broke down the course and the spectator, you know, concept and everything out there. Do you feel like there's anything else where you're like, yeah, you know, uh, the disc golf community should know about blank um, that maybe wasn't obvious, whether it was on paper or, or on camera or anything else. Is there anything else that you, you take away from this weekend? 
Yeah, it's actually funny. One thing that comes to my head is like putting, you know, I think that as a spectator, if you guys are watching these tournaments, uh, 25, 30 footers under pressure down the stretch of a tournament, those are no gimmies. And like, yeah, we make them, and play, but like we're stressing. Like I guarantee Kyle was stressing and very nervous. I was definitely because there was a lot of, you know, 25, 30 footers into a headwind with the slope behind the group basket. Like stuff can go bad quick. And so like getting those bad thoughts of like, you know, what could happen out of your head is hard sometimes, especially when you have pressure and nerves. Um, so those things are battles we're fighting within ourselves, like having to make those 25, 30 footers. It's, it's a mental, mental battle. You really have to fight through those pressure and the nerves. And, and it's, it's not easy. 25, 30 footers, you know, on round one is a lot easier than a 30 footer into a headwind with a cliff right behind the basket, you know, on hole 15 or 14 of the tournament. <laughs> uh, know, yeah. And, over if you miss it no no and it's funny because a lot of us were talking about that at one point like how easy you guys now make it look where i just expect you everything circles edge or in we just expect you like i almost turn off my brain for a moment of like oh yeah they're gonna make this and clearly you guys all mostly do make it look easy but there's it's good to hear that you still have those those thoughts and emotions that are running through your head one of the there, there's an interesting philosophy of like how much we talk about the money, the record setting purse, the insane paycheck that's, you know, given out. And then there's some people that are like, who cares? Um, you know, we're putting too much emphasis on the money. And I always think, well, I, I guess what era of disc golf did you come into? You know, did you learn about the sport? Because people used to play for a whole year and 40 grand was a good year for Barry Schultz or a, a Felberg or yeah. a Nicola Castro or even Ricky early or even a Ricky career. early years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I guess, yeah. I guess how, how would you, uh, you know, has the money changed at all for you? I mean, the money's changed Has the, has the money changed your outlook, your mentality, your feelings? How, how do you, how, does it matter? Does uh, so, how big that check was? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, of course. The money, the money is always. It's 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 cool to be able to be like, all right, I got an extra forty thousand. What am I gonna do with it? You know, like, that is that is always a lot of fun. Um, but for me, it's you know, I started playing disc golf for the sole fact that I just I loved playing. I had a passion for it. Um, and when I decided, you know, I wanted to make this my career, I didn't I didn't know how. I didn't know that you know, if there was really gonna if this was really gonna be a viable option. I just. I just put all my eggs in, in the disc golf basket and said, all right, I'm going on tour. So I never really, I didn't know how much money was in my future. If there was any, I didn't know if I was going to go on tour for two years and then be like, all right, well, this ain't working out. Um, but I just love the game. And I, so I think that that kind of has carried me through and it's the type of thing to where, you know, obviously the new money is great and I'm able to, to do a lot of things that I wouldn't do without it. Um, but it's the passion, just being able to, to do what I love week in and week out competing playing disc golf going you know traveling the country so all the things that go along with it yeah of course there's some negatives you don't you know you don't get a home life you don't get to you know all that stuff you miss out on a lot of stuff as well um but um but i think this the the word to describe it is just the passion you know for me it's it's the passion that drives me it's the passion that you know i love i love what happened this last week and i absolutely love that you know you know obviously i love to win um, but I just love putting myself in contention to have that chance to win and, and seeing how I handle the pressure and seeing, you know, um, how it plays out and, and how, you know, hey, if, what, if I did something wrong, how can I change that for next time when I get in this situation? So all things just are what I love and what I crave um, as a competitor in this in this sport. And I think that um, the money is really is a is kind of a side thing. And of course, it's my career. I'm, I'm, I'm in it, you know. For the money to a certain extent extent um but um you know what really fuels me is you know the passion and the money is kind of a side thing uh this gets in the weeds just a little bit but it, obviously you have a, a very significant contract uh i mean there was a helicopter involved for god's sake so <laughs> a very significant contract uh <laughs> with dynamic discs uh, where there's a lot of guaranteed money, you know, we see discs with your names on, uh, with your name on it, and such, and and whatnot. Are, are things like bonuses still in play? If you win an event like this, are there still bonuses that can be in play, and 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 are they limited to just like here's an extra check, or 
you know, do they work it in where sometimes a commemorative discs are released? Like what, what are some of the types of things that is in the works for you? Yeah. So, um, a lot of the stuff is, is put towards my salary. So like, obviously the tournament winnings are like, that's mine. Um, mm-hmm. but like the, like the commemorative discs and some of the bonuses, it depends on how it's structured, but most of, a lot of them are put in towards the tournament towards my guaranteed money that i'm making okay um so it's not like um you know and i do like a i have like a multiplier type thing like if i win one elite series it's x amount the next week or the next elite series is double and then triple Mm. so kind of how that bonus works is and i just it's just kind of a cool cool way to you know motivate me hey you know that third one it starts adding up a lot obviously this (laughs) you have to big to three but that's okay. and uh, get that multiplier going um back to your um uh, money talk is it something that's also been you know with me since i signed the contract with dynamic is i've just always been the type of person that like since dynamics you know took a shot on me and, and, and i want to go out there and do what i just did this last weekend and to give back and say hey thank you like you know you know for taking the shot at this money you know, I want to go out there and be the best, the best represent your brand um, and so that's something that definitely I think about is um, I feel the the need to to, to go over the top and, and really you know represent their brand in, in an amazing way and just be and be genuine about it real, real quick and I guess this is a this is a great question for you we're gonna probably talk a little bit about a new a little news that came out yesterday or maybe it was even today i don't know i think it was yesterday about uh, house of disc has anything changed with you and dynamic with the the organ with the house of discs now uh with their kind of acquisition so to speak or is or from your perspective is everything still the same yeah so from the player side i think it's for the most part the same there's obviously a couple there's a there's a new guy at dynamic david Hyam, mm-hmm. who i've been working with a lot more um so he is um he's been kind of like taking over the role of uh, what Rusko used to do, and Rusko kind of stepped down a little bit. He's still involved, um, so he's kind of the guy, the point, of, uh, not the point of contact, but the guy that we work with a lot on discs and a lot of different other stuff, new new disc releases, that kind of stuff. So, so from my standpoint, I have a new guy that I'm talking to there, um, but a lot of the stuff is behind the scenes business stuff that doesn't affect the players as much. Um, we still have the same team managers and you know points of contact for the most part. And, um, and a lot of it's just, you know, big corporate, you know, investor <laughs> stuff that I'm not really familiar with. Yet. Yeah. You, and you, nor <laughs> and, do you and need to yeah, be. you may not ever need to be as right. long as, as long as your right. check clears and you got your bonus structure right. in place, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, exactly. you should be good. And we had, we had, we were fortunate enough to meet David. Yeah. At, well, you had met him, I think previous yeah. to this, I was fortunate enough to meet him at USDGC, shake his hand, talk with him and Russ, go a little bit. Seems like a great stand up dude. So. I'm, I'm happy yeah. you guys get to work with him. Cool. Well, glad you got to meet him. Yeah, he, he does seem cool. Yeah, so um, m- maybe kind of uh, adjacent to all of that uh, chatter is this year, clearly it was kind of a, a shock to the system for the rest of the world as well that we didn't have Ari and that you had uh, Fern, Fern Dog on the bag <laughs> and on the cart, uh, I should say. And it, do you have you guys talked about next year? I mean, clearly... Even though abbreviated, the season was amazing. Uh, is there, are there applications? Is there a waiting list right now of people trying <laughs> trying to uh, to join you? Um, have you guys started negotiating for next year? What's what's all that look like? And is he currently driving right now? <laughs> yeah, he is currently driving. He's trying to apply. <laughs> he could drive you right off the road, you know, if you don't answer right. <laughs> like, oh, oh, did we just get T-bone? Sorry, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny yeah yeah no it's uh it's been great it's been a great transition um he's done he's done a great job um just like anything he's figured out a lot of uh things that he didn't realize were were tasks and jobs that he had to do that he didn't realize were were having having to happen just as far as points of contact uh with with sponsors with dynamic with all my other sponsors with the tax people all that kind of stuff but then on top of that, it's the day to day. Hey, where are we going to stay? What Airbnb are we going to set up at this tournament? And so there's just, you'd be surprised at how much stuff that, um, that pops up. And so there, 
it's it's a full time job, no doubt. And even in the off season, it's not like hey, we're off season. We're, we're just like you said, Terry. It's not like hey, we're just going to Mexico for two months and just doing nothing. <laughs> like, no, I might do that for a week, but like right after that, we're right back to like hey, you know, what do we, you know, Brixton sending cards. We got to sign these cards, mm. and then hey, what we got to come up with this disc, and then hey, we want to film this video. It's just you know, as you know, it's just how the world goes. The world keeps moving, and so there's always something to do. Um, but yeah, he's he's. He's starting to figure out all that stuff out, and it's starting to get more streamlined. Um, and I, I, I got a, I got a laptop for him, so he's got he's doing the emails every day uh, with all the people you know that we work with, and and so, so yeah, he's done he's done an amazing job, and he'll he will be back next year. Uh, he usually stays with me in in Arizona, um, obviously because there's a lot of day to day stuff that pops up in the off season as well, and he'll go home for the holidays and stuff. But a lot of times, um, yeah, we're working on projects in the off season as well. Um, so, so it, it works out that we're able to, to be there and he's able to be at the house and, and they're working on stuff there as well. Very cool. Well, we'll have to have a interview with him one of these days with you, not in the car and we'll get his side <laughs> and see how, how it I differs like it. from what you maybe, just tell. <laughs> that's true. Maybe, maybe when you, uh, come to the house, you can do that. We can do that. There you go. You can do that special interview. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll get yeah. the real inside scoop. And then, and then he tells me he's, uh, he's holding out. There's an arbitrator and, uh, holding out for contract negotiations and he's got other spawns, yeah, exactly. uh, other players, <laughs> you know, beating on his door, uh, in, in a serious capacity though. I mean, obviously we've seen a number of players, you know, have these great support systems. You know, Ari was also one of the ones that had, you know, really dedicated herself and, and Fern has stepped into that role. Do you feel as if just generically speaking, we're going to see more of that? is is you know what would be your and this would be a question for him too but what would be your recommendation for someone that's sitting at home and saying hey i don't think i'm going to make it as a a pro or that's just not where i'm at right now and i would really love to be on the team of blank like yeah. would, would you have any uh you know initial thoughts or recommendations yeah, so i would say yeah i mean just just like anything uh, you know ask 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 and you shall receive you know like if ask ask a player uh, hey do you do you is this something you'd be into if you're if you're wanting to do that say hey are you looking for any help um next season um reach out to them see if they have any interest of it in it because if a player does feel like they have too much on their plate and they want to delegate certain things and you can help um as a potential tour manager uh, that's definitely something that you know is starting to become more of an option and more of a job role that you know is you know sustainable and so i think that you know as as we get more and more money more and more sponsors that also means more you know more contracts more emails more points all that stuff mm -hmm. so as as you guys know i'm a disc golfer i'm not a i'm not a tax person i'm not a you know contract lawyer none of that stuff so um so having someone help with all that stuff helps you be able to to go outside and and, and putt for to an hour or an hour mm -hmm. and a half a day instead of doing emails for that long. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think of your team and I, I just, I so applaud and always reference you and what you've done. Obviously at a lot of events, you guys are, are physically set up in vending, which is an opportunity to be making money, whether it's for yourself or for the whole team, but just a, an on-site yeah. person to person vending situation and then knowing that you know sunstein law has helped you out with some stuff in the past knowing that uh you know lws helps you out with some contract stuff shout out to lws who does our taxes exactly <laughs> so like you know all oh, of nice. these that's all of these different you know th that's why all these people exist and and how they're now becoming more and more viable and then having someone like fern do what he does which is a, a ton of additional work and in whether he's a conduit or exclusively handles some of that there's there's just a lot of stuff going on is there with all of that said and i know i know dynamic takes really good care of you but is there any other need that you have right now from a sponsor perspective if if you know just kind of as an open-ended question someone said hey i do blank um you know i wonder if this would help or benefit rick is there is there any other kind of need that's that you can that's swirling around in your head that you currently aren't connected with um i'm not that's a good question i mean i think that you know it's it's kind of like a type of thing where when the opportunity arises you know if someone reaches out and says hey i have this company or i you know i'm associated with x company like 
then that's kind of when it opens my eyes. But I, and and I, that's also what like what you guys said. LWS they also do the sports agency stuff for mm-hmm. us. So if there's a company that like, hey, can you pursue uh, a random I don't know, let's say apparel or beef shoes company or whatever shoes jerky, they'll, they'll, sure, yeah, yeah. Shoes. yeah, exactly. So they'll reach out and and uh, give them all the numbers. Obviously, like, hey, here's Ricky. Here's his impressions on YouTube and. Um, you know, Instagram, all that different stuff. And so that they, they can just represent, hey, here, here's the package deal for what you're getting in our player, whether it's me or Ezra or Isaac, whoever it may be. They, they, we all have their own impressions, and obviously that we represent as a brand. And so they can represent that, that to the company and say, hey, here, here's here's the offer. Here's what we, you know, here's what he's wanting per month. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot more that goes into it, but then they represent that package to them. And so that's... Um, another thing that's delegated to, to them um that they do um but but yeah i think that that's you know he handles a lot of that stuff and then mostly it just comes down to like hey there's a company that i want to or like a snack that i like i'll just tell them the brand and say hey hit them up and see if they're interested and it's either yes or no and and then you, you know you, you know obviously that's how you get sponsors okay um it is this is kind of a side note. I'm just I'm thinking about some overall stats and numbers and things as you were just talking about. Uh, with, with that money, and it was Sexton that kind of uh, I don't know fell into this on on Sunday afternoon. With that forty thousand dollars added uh, to your overall career earnings, uh, you're somewhere around six hundred and ninety some thousand career earnings, just shy of seven hundred. Uh, we believe that. Uh, Macbeth is got seven thirty six or seven whatever it is. You're you're about forty or forty eight thousand uh, separate from Macbeth in terms of career earnings. You're like one more Pro Tour championship away. <laughs> exactly. Do, yeah. Does does a stat <laughs> like that? Does career earnings? Is that a stat you have ever looked at or care about? Is it something that's on your radar? How how do you feel it's, about I mean, career earnings? It's definitely cool. I think anytime you can add stats and like give someone a shoot for like, hey, let's who could be the first one to make it to a million, you know, that kind of thing. Like, mm-hmm. that's kind of cool, you know. And okay. so I think that obviously me and Paul being, you know, being in the game as long as we have, like, you know, I'm sure we're the two highest right now. Um, I think that you know that's going to be kind of a cool storyline. Like, who's gonna who's gonna hit the million first, you know? Um, you know, so that's definitely yeah. I mean, obviously. You know that's 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 definitely something fun to shoot for. As a competitor, you're always looking for milestones to break and records to beat, and and so that's just gonna kind of add to that. Okay, I I just it was something that uh, again I'm not sure. Well, obviously everyone's talking about you know that significant of a paycheck getting added to your overall ter- total earnings for the year, and then uh, I think that's what kind of got the juices flowing for for. Uh, Sexton to look into it. With quick sidebar to that, since we're kind of in that neighborhood, uh, again, abbreviated season, of course. But w- what does that say about our sport when Kristen, uh, you know, kind of a fellow teammate of sorts within the same, you know, overall branding, Kristen, uh, largest money winner in a single season ever this year out of all players, MPO or FPO? Uh, how do you react to that? I mean, it's just it's it's very impressive. I mean, as a as a top athlete myself, I you know I totally respect that, and uh, people just have to realize how how consistent, how hard it is to play at the top level. As you guys are seeing, um, it's hard it's hard out there sometimes. Uh, you know, it doesn't always go your way, and and to for her to win as much as she has is is extremely impressive. And obviously, she's getting rewarded, and uh, she well deserves the money she makes because she. Um, She's just a great competitor who has all the shots. She knows how to handle pressure. She knows how to handle nerves. Um, and so she's just got the full package. Uh, and and it's, it is very impressive to watch. I enjoy watching the FPO coverage before before my rounds. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it on and, and watch her. Um, but, yeah, she's just got it all. She's such a good shot shaper. I think that's really where she sets herself apart. She can shape a backhand. She can shape a forehand. Um, she's got no weaknesses. And I think that that's, you know, just something that's, you know, she's going to be great for the next eight to 10 years. No doubt about that. Yeah. I, I think it's easy for us to forget that, um, you know, she's, she's 31, 32. She obviously has a daughter uh, and that she's pro- competed in other professional sports 
And you just, as you just said, eight, eight to 10 years, she's going to clearly be good for a long time yet. And we're going to continue to see a lot of people come up and try and challenge her. Um, but it, uh, it's, it's just wild to see. And it's awesome. My only, my follow up to all of that is she landed in Estonia and was greeted with flowers. Are, are, is somebody going to have flowers at your place when you finally get into your house tonight? I'm not sure. I, uh, so I actually Airbnb my house this year to like try, test it out while I was on the tour. Okay. Um, so if anyone wants to Airbnb my house in the next <laughs> off season, next season, let me okay. know. <laughs> Heck yeah. Uh, but um, so we'll see if the property management left me some flowers. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, Chris got me there. <laughs> uh, uh, and do you, it, <laughs> that, that's kind of funny. I think like in theory. If it went to a disc golfer, you should be getting some premium that it's Ricky Wysocki's. Like to Joe, you know, to Joe Schmo and his four buddies who just play golf, or they're down there to watch, you know, the PGA Tour or something else, whatever. Yeah. Maybe they don't care. But you've got to assume yeah. you're going to get some disc golfers that are going to be in there that are going to want your place. Yeah, I've never really advertised it like like it's my house, so uh -huh. people, people don't really know for sure. But I do have uh, baskets in the back. So in the Airbnb like listing, I have uh, baskets and stuff, and like, and the the maids that clean it, they'll like put the discs on the on the kitchen table, so like you can go put <laughs> in the backyard. So I have a couple, I've had a couple reviews of people like, oh, I've never played disc golf, but I went and put it in the back. It's so uh, fun nice. and all this stuff. So, so yeah, it's kind of a cool little, uh, cool cool to have a little, you know, a couple baskets in the backyard for people to throw at and have fun, even if they've never played before. Give right? everyone the sales pitch. What what are some of the other amenities included uh, at your at your house? So we are call it the Desert Oasis. That's what it's called. That's what the name of it is on Airbnb. We got baskets. We got you can play at night. I've strung up lights so that way when I practice but at night, uh, I can I can see. So you got night bat night baskets. You you got a hot. You got let's see what else we got here. We got a pool table, poker table. Um, we have a nice big kitchen. I have I have closed off my. My theater movie room, though, there's I have a movie room that I've actually I locked the door and don't let anybody in there. That's my personal space. That's the man cave there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but that, and then the garage, kind of like I'll put all my purse, some of my personal stuff in the garage when I leave for the tour, and then lock that, and then everybody has access to everything except the the garage and the movie room. But okay. there's, still, there's still four other bedrooms for you, so you're, you should have plenty of space. Four other bedrooms. All right. All right. Yeah. Good. And there's a bedroom for you, Terry, and and, and if you want to, Johnny, do. Oh well, thank you. If, all if, right. Maybe yeah. uh, maybe come next spring, we'll we'll get a chance to get over there. Terry will be there in a few weeks. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah, I, I just might take you up on it. I'm coming out for the PLO, uh, the Phoenix Ladies Open. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna, Lily's gonna play that. So yeah, you should definitely come stay. All right. Sweet. Well, that uh, that yeah. uh, looks to be the plan. Uh, all right, Rick. We uh, how how much longer do you have before you get home? I know you ran into traffic today, but are you almost home? Yeah, we did. Yeah, ran into traffic, but uh, two and a half hours. So uh, I'm so excited to just flop on my bed and not do anything <laughs> for a couple of days. I'm super excited. Good. Uh, all right. Well, before we let you go, it's funny because that's what the Diamondbacks did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Oh my gosh. I I haven't been able to watch because I've been talking to you guys. What happened? No bueno. Uh, you. Let's just say the Diamondbacks need to win out. <laughs> oh God! They lost ten right, nothing. It was it was a massacre. Oh, Ouch! It, well, the bummer is I bought tickets for Saturday, thinking like, oh, they're not going to get swept, and then like if they they could get swept, and Saturday might not even be a thing. <laughs> I I don't think they'll get swept, but yeah. it's no, I don't think so. Either. The way the Phillies are playing, <laughs> it's 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 looking it's tough, man. They're playing hard. All right, Rick. Give us, uh, give everyone your your shout outs, your thanks. Uh, you know, people either you want to recognize or or any other final call outs and uh, anything else you need before we let you go here tonight. I'd like to thank Terry. <laughs> okay, Rick's Rick's currently. Of course. Dynamic Disc, my sponsor. All right, Rick, 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 we're going to have you start over. We want to make sure it's nice and clean. You, you chopped up on us for a second, so start over from the top. Okay. Who do you got? Okay, sorry. I want to thank my team, obviously. I want to thank Vern. Uh, he's obviously helped a lot. I want to thank my girlfriend, Lily. She helps a lot of day to day stuff as well. And I want to thank uh, my sponsor, Dynamic Disc, and they uh, support me even when I was hurt, injured, and 
went to uh, Circle One as well. So Circle One is also another my apparel sponsor this year. Uh, extra polos and all that cool stuff that I was wearing. So that's uh, that's been fun to to rock that. And thank you guys. It's awesome to be able to share some share some of my thoughts with the fans. And uh, thanks for giving me the platform to do that. Yeah, yeah of, uh, obviously you're always welcome here, Rick. We'd love to have you every each and every time that you're uh, that you're available. And we can't thank you enough uh, and, for coming on the show. And one other last thing I want to say is I want to also shout out my foundation. We are doing a tournament in Phoenix in January. Uh, I'm not sure yet the date, but it's going to be the beginning of early next year. We're going to do uh, some sort of pro-am type thing. And uh, so be on the lookout for that. I'm going to be posting that, and uh, that'll be great. Sweet. Well, Rick, uh, you know, of course, congratulations. Congratulations on making the season that you did with the abbreviated time frame. And I, I know how painful it was to sit out and, you know, to battle the way you did, but then to come back and then still, you know, finish fourth in the tour standings to give yourself the positioning and then, you know, have this epic battle in and tour championship it was pretty awesome to see everything down the stretch so uh congratulations on overall just an incredible season and thank you for joining us here tonight and hopefully i'll see you in a couple weeks yes we'll see i'll, I'll get your room ready after i flop in my bed <laughs> <laughs> let it give, give him two or three days and then he'll make your bed yeah i want a different bed yes, yeah not yeah, that exactly. one that's weird okay all right rick you guys be safe uh love to everyone else you're traveling with and uh we'll all see right. you soon have a good one Ricky uh, why Saki? Sometimes here, sometimes not. You know that I, you, you get that when you're driving, especially like him driving in Arizona through some desert areas. Yeah. I'm sure if he's only a few hours away, it's not necessarily the most uh, conducive to, uh, to 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 a to a live broadcast like that. But obviously, as always, we want to thank him for his time and uh, and joining us because he put on a phenomenal show. Honestly, his putting. <sighs> I, I just think of him and Ezra Robinson. Their putting this weekend was insane. Watching Ricky just drain a long putt, and then Ezra drain a long putt, then yeah. Ricky drain a long putt. It was really, it was a really fun watch. Um, I got to watch the MPO this weekend, and it was, uh, it was good. It was a good broadcast, Terry Miller. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, one thing that we still struggled with, and. Uh, you know, from a technology perspective, is is there's just a few spots on that course in particular. 13, 14, 13, 14, yeah, definitely all come to mind as ones that really struggle in terms of the, the location. And I know they have extra, uh, you know, signal boosters and things of that type and network stuff and all this other stuff. And it's just as much as everyone says, well, how is it still this way? Well, because the technology to some degree is still ne Nev still limiting to ne some degree. Like it Nevin's it a little ways away from Charlotte. It's like a half hour outside of like downtown Charlotte, I think I had heard. Is that right? I don't know about that, but uh, I don't know if it's oh. quite that far. But nope. nonetheless, oh, I here okay. here this would be my analogy. You have the Google Pixel Pixel well, 7 and you get the 8. There might be incremental improvements, but it's not going to be revolutionary in the same year. That's kind of where I feel like some of the technology and overall cellular servicing and devices are as well. And I and I'm not I'm not here to make excuses or anything of that nature. I'm just trying to explain. I I saw someone say, "Well, you know, all of it's really not that hard." Hmm. If yeah. they just wanted to spend the money. They they said that part. Uh, well. The money meaning millions upon millions of dollars. Oh, well, yeah, lots and, of money makes things a lot really easy. Exactly. So, um I understand that it's it can be frustrating uh, sometimes for some to watch. I, I'm not is, making any excuses. It's just where we're at. Which is funny because I didn't think it was that bad this weekend. Like there were some spots where it got a little pixelated. I know because I was cutting the FPO show and we ran into the same things at times. And with the MPO show, there's usually a few more spectators, which means there's more bandwidth being used. We've talked about this for years now. Um, but like when I got to hole 14, I took a lot of them from the catch cam because that was the more open T mm -hmm. or the old more open camera. And you just kind of have to play around yeah, the, the things. And I've explained this to multiple people that people can get frustrated with is um, how come you use this camera on this shot? Like th this is the worst angle you can choose. And I just explained sometimes you just have to work with what you're given. It's yeah. not necessarily the ideal camera that I would always want to take, but maybe 
we're down a camera because a cameraman has to switch batteries. Like the our camera three, who is the uh, who's the gimbal camera, he's got to carry that thing. And sometimes they take breaks because that isn't necessarily the most easy thing to do. Or when they do want to switch out, change batteries, or remove ponchos or whatever they're doing for someone like camera three, that takes a lot longer because they kind of have to disassemble and reassemble some things. We saw it at one point um, at uh, on day one. I actually covered MPO on day one uh, because of some scheduling issues. Camera three was following Ricky into the woods. Sorry, Rick, you were going in the woods. Probably one of his double one of his bogeys. double bogeys. He had more than any other uh, MPO player. And suddenly, he we get to hit the spot, and the camera suddenly flips upside down, and it's just literally the gimbal battery. I, I don't know if it came unplugged or just died. So the gimbal, which is obviously constantly being balanced by, you know, this little motor just gave out and flipped upside down. And at that point, I'm like, oh, crap, I got to pick another camera. And then you just take a camera that you can. I know we've been saying this for years and we'll continue to say it. Growing pains, they're getting less and less. You know, it's it, we're, we have more options than we ever had before. But nothing is going to be, you know, we're we're, we're not going to be the NFL, the PGA anytime soon. And we just keep working with what we have and that's what we do. But I didn't think the signal was. Yeah, there were, there were sections where it definitely struggled on both MPO and FPO rounds. Uh, You know, if you're, if you're seeing it pixelated at home, we're seeing it pixelated on our screen as well. And yeah, I'll say it again. That's what we said during when, when talking to Rick, that can be one of the additional challenges when you go to some of these more wooded courses. And it's not just the woods. It also can depend on the actual location. You might have a wide open course out in the middle of nowhere with no signal. That's possible too. Or sometimes you're uh, buried in the heart of a course, but it's close enough to signal, so it's it's flawless. There, Those are all the things that we're continuously working through. Um, and again, I'm not making excuses. I'm just making an explanation that it's it's not nearly as easy as everyone thinks that it is. No, uh, and and in, until there's uh, multi millions of dollars uh, getting put into it, it's it's not just going to magically appear to be crystal clear. And, and even then, it's still going to be it's, tough. It's still tough. It's it, just, we're still you know, following people, and... people through the woods to show you frisbee golf shots, like just. It's still going to be difficult. Um, and the last thing I'll say on this is one f- kind of funny chuckle I got is the whole um, someone had posted how much money the Disc Golf Pro Tour put into, I think, the the event and this and that. And then they had said something like, TV truck, only 4500 bucks. <laughs> and I just was just like, and I just responded. I said, well, if you think a TV truck is going to solve our problems, I question every one of your takes from here on out. Like, yeah. It just... It, I, yeah, I got I got a kick out of that. But let's talk about the FPO division. Well, first let's run through the MPO and how everybody finished. Obviously, Ricky, the non-winners, the non-winners. The Don't losers. call them losers. No, the losers. Okay, they all lost. You said it. Yeah. Well, they all lost. They can they can admit it to it or not. They all lost to Ricky. <laughs> Hate to say it, but they did. Uh, the very first loser was Kyle. Clark. Only winning twenty two thousand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he won the week before and he lost this week. You know, we call it like we see it. <laughs> um, uh, second place was Kyle Klein, in by a single stroke. But as Ricky said, it probably could have been two if Ricky had really tr- made an effort on that, uh, or, or maybe it could have been three with the way Ricky was playing. Um, if he really wanted to to push it on that final hole, but Kyle Klein putting up just a really good weekend, really good two weeks to be honest. Um, to get to himself a second place, and what was that twenty twenty two thousand two thousand yes, and becoming the the guy to win the most in you in know like one a, month period or something yeah, of that nature of fifty two thousand. Well, first and second at two of your largest payouts of the year will do that. That'll do that, which will be, probably be broken next year with all the majors at the end of the year. <laughs> like, yeah, it's going to be ridiculous. A uh, third place, Calvin Heimberg shooting eleven down. Uh, uh, he shot a nine down on the final round, so he made a huge push jumping up three spots to get to that third place. He looked really, really good that final round. Did not look so good the third round, unfortunately, and put him in a real hole compared to Ricky where he would have had to really do something miraculous and need probably a little help up top in order for him to come back and win. Tied for fourth place, Isaac Robinson and Adam Hammes. Who Adam, as we said, fought his way, I don't want to say snuck in, but fought his way into the finals having to sit and watch some competitors finish up 
you know, watching Proctor miss a putt and these things that just stacked up to let Adam get in. And he made, I don't say he made the most of it, but he made a pretty good uh, fourth place finish. Fifth place, or I'm sorry, tied single sixth place. I'm sorry about that. Gannon Burr, seventh place, Joel Freeman, eighth place, Ezra Robinson, and then tied for ninth, Anthony Barella and Cole Radalin. So that is your DGBT championship on the MPO side. Uh, do you have any other takes from the MPO? Like I said, I thought Ezra, it was fun watching Ezra Robinson. He ended up kind of falling down the the, the board a little bit, but he was putting in putts from everywhere on that course, it felt like. I, at one point I was thinking, is are the Robinson brothers the best one-two combo? With like, I think Isaac is probably one of the best C1 putters in our game, and Ezra might be one of the best C2 putters in our game. The way it, the way it's looking, so got a kick out of that. Terry, did you have any takes on the MPO? Uh, nothing. Nothing else crazy. Uh, you know, it was cool to see. First of all, that the players obviously got used to the course for as much as everyone you know called it daunting and and knew how difficult it was. It's crazy that within a couple of days, they kind of figured it out. The wins were also low all weekend, which I'm sure didn't hurt anything. But nonetheless, the scoring's that impressive. There was just so much respect and almost almost even a fear of that course going into it than to see them uh, finish the way they did. The birdies that were strung together by the likes of Hamas, Heimberg, uh, you know, obviously Ricky at one point and a, a number of those players, uh, Robinson. I thought that was really impressive. It, it, no surprise, you know, again, we have this conversation and I, it, I'm a contractor, otherwise doesn't matter. We have the conversation that purely from an aesthetics perspective, finishing on 17 and 18 is not something that I loved. I understand times a million why the holes were way, they were the way they were so that people could see them. They obviously were incredibly daunting and challenging, playing as two of the most difficult holes on the course. I get all of that. You I don't liked, have to sell me on that. I liked the whole 18 design that it gave you an opportunity to go for the three. Of course. To, but, you know, but, it but did, from the, I'll say the drone angle, which looked really cool, also looked really tacky with all the field bingo. lines. And, bingo. We're, and, we are literally, and I get it. I am not, I'm so not ripping on anyone which, which is really strange because if you think about it just this past well, yesterday maybe even um college basketball went into a football arena set up a court and there's this huge drone picture of a basketball court perpendicular basically in the end zone is what it would be it looked like it's bigger than that but it's in the end zone and the stadium full of people and all i was thinking is like does that look tacky like that basketball is going into a college football stadium, setting it up. Hockey does that like once a yeah, year. Yeah, but it's all about the stands Co and the fans. Correct. Cross country, they indoor. They, you know, some of their. You know, if you talk to and granted, this is you know a lot of high school, but you know a lot of their stuff are on golf courses where they draw lines and 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 they're running through woods or fields or whatever the heck those cross country people do. Mo, Mo is yeah, probably cross pulling. country. They're literally supposed to run across. Yeah, I know Mo's probably that's yelling a different, at me right now. Yeah, that's different. But, but I just uh, think of some of these other sports that are literally pushing themselves into other arenas and we are playing on a different environment because that's the level of which we're at. Because we need the space though. We need Co the open correct. space and that's why they're closing out on those holes. I just don't like it. And and it's the same reason nobody likes to see us mm -hmm. throwing over a parking lot at Winthrop. You know, there's there's just things that at some point we're going to leave those in the past and I understand it's infrastructure and it's all in due time and it'll all happen and I'm not trying to get all snooty and elitist, you know, as to where professional disc golf is because we've made these insane strides. I just it, there's something about the, the best way to understand how 18 is played and 17 is with a drone. And then the drone, unfortunately is just like, Oh, okay. So we're playing through someone's soccer field. Mm -hmm. I just, I just I don't love it. I don't think anyone loves it. I think, I think if the it, soccer uh, lines weren't there, would that make you feel better? Like if, if, if they was just uh, largely, grass. yeah, if it was just a, a, like a field that was strong, that would somehow make it feel a little bit better mm -hmm. to me. And that maybe is really nitpicky. But it just, 
it would just it just looks like we're playing disc golf across the soccer field and and that is no shot at the club and we're doing it so we can have as many spectators be able to see what's happening i understand i'm not an idiot I just I don't think anyone loves that look. No, I don't. Th- I think you're done. right. I think you're right. It's just again what we're what we're kind of stuck with. So um, no, I, I don't know if there's anything else though from the MPO perspective necessarily that was groundbreaking or earth shattering. All right, well, uh, we saw we saw who made it and who didn't. All right, moving on to FPO. Missy Gannon, what big, big money Missy as they seem to call her. She shows up for the big events. That tends to win the. The uh, the large pursed. She likes events. to do that. Yeah, she. Uh, it was funny because when she won, Jeff announced like our first two time champion, and all of us in the control room were like, "Nope, not true." <laughs> <laughs> like Katrina, I think has won twice, um, and then we have had a couple. You no, know, Dickerson won twice. Ricky had at the time won twice, then ended up getting his third time. So it it was really funny internally listening to Jeff and he, I, I don't know what he meant to say if, if he just missed something or, uh, or just, I, I, I will never second guess somebody else, either, uh, oh God, no, misstepping I'm... or mispronouncing and, or, uh, oh, jumbling up something we've, either. We've made plenty uh, of mistakes. <laughs> yeah. I'll do that 10 more times tonight and then I'll jumble it up next time I get on any other microphone. But yes, it, it, it was not necessarily, uh, Missy's, Missy wasn't the first to be our No, she wasn't. And FPL. Missy jumped up two spots to get to that first place. She was a two seed going into the event, but even that final round, I believe she was in like uh she was in third place clearly, jumped up two spots to get to first place. Uh shooting a three under par that round while Own Scoggins, who took second place tied with Cat Merch, struggled on the back nine mightily and just took bogey after bogey after bogey really set her back and cost her the win is really ultimately what it did. So Own Scoggins takes second, tied with Cat Merch. Cat Merch, just a pretty solid weekend. Nothing, it didn't feel like anything spectacular for Cat. Just really played round after round after round and just played well. Uh, maybe the biggest surprise, so to speak, is Kristen Tatar in fourth place. She shot a one over par that round and moved up. I'm sorry, she shot a one under par that round, a one over par total, and moved up a spot. She was on our chase card that mm-hmm. final day, which not very often you say Kristen Tarr on the chase card the final day. Um, Kristen just made, she made some Instagram posts talking about how she was happy the season was over. The end of the season didn't go as the way she uh, completely imagined, that she hit all of her season-long goals, but just... Some it seems like some mental and maybe a little physical struggles at the end of the season. You can understand her being away from home. We, we've said it numerous times with some of the players that uh, a little bit more difficult for Kristen probably to keep that well full, as Ricky says so eloquently. Um, Kristen tied for fourth with Haley King in sixth place. Allie Smith and Allie was kind of our surprise so to speak, to get into the finals, the semifinal round. She was out of position, moved herself up to get into position, and I'm going to pat myself on the back just a little bit. That final day uh, in the control room, we're all looking at the scores. Mo already has some storylines planned out, and I had she was one that I had said, I said, listen, if someone's going to sneak in, I think it's going to be Allie Smith. And Mo was like, I don't know, I'm not sure. He's like, she might just be a little too far out of it. And I was like, maybe, you know, any of us could be right. We don't know. But Allie Smith did get herself into the final. So congratulations, Allie. Seventh place, Stacey Ronsley. And eighth place, Jen Allen. So those are your top eight. And you're only eight in the finals for the FPO division. So congratulations to the women. Um, And, of course, Missy Gannon getting 40K. An amazing payout, as we always say, with these uh, tour championships. Yeah, and I I guess you have to do the math. Well, you don't because it doesn't really matter. I was going to say, uh, Jen Allen had just made the joke that after she had made the one from the semifinals and then made it into the finals, we heard her as she was kind of getting ready to leave the the course or close out a round. She's like, oh, I got to go change my flight. Uh, Not necessarily expecting to make it into the finals. Uh, Just get it from, if you made it into the semis, you got 2,500 on the FPO side. And then even if you took eighth place as she did by a single stroke, you 
you made four grand. So as long as her, as long so as her 15, airfare, fifteen hundred dollar difference. Mm-hmm. Airfare, An extra night, two nights at a hotel if you stay there. Uh, let's say some it's three hundred bucks, yeah. and then airfare change, extending on your rental car. Two. I mean, she probably still came out at least eight hundred a half, and she probably didn't pay for <laughs> most of those things. I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, I think she. I'm pretty sure she's a Southwest kind of gal like I am. So oh, she yeah. probably, uh, you change know, change your flights for free. Everything was good to go, and obviously, I do not. <laughs> I, I'm, no. I'm jokingly saying that because clearly she could have turned her twenty five hundred into to 40,000 had she uh, went on to win it. So, but uh, yeah, that was kind of one of the funny side stories. Another story that we'll just briefly touch on, especially since you guys asked about earlier, uh, it it was after the round, the semis uh, concluded. So round two, technically on Friday, if you were watching or listening to the static camera that was on hole 18, the companion, the companion stream, the static camera that was on hole 18, you could overhear, or hear, I guess overhear is not even the right word, you could hear um, a conversation that seemed to get a little punchy. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, little, a verbally, little, a figuratively. Little, a little heated. A little yeah, heated. Yeah, let's not say punchy. A <laughs> exactly. little heated. Exactly. Uh, figuratively punchy. A little heated conversation, and largely it just basically stemmed around the fact of, you know, Jessica Weiss had closed out uh, and struggled mightily to close out. I think she went bogey and then f- uh, 5X bogey or 4X, yes. uh, not quad, but sin, whatever that is. Yeah, she took, a, uh, she took a nine. She took a nine. So that would be a quad bogey, that, that one I can pronounce. it's a par five, yeah. Yeah, so it's a par five. And, and kind of um, crazy enough, if Jessica, instead of going five over on the last two holes, just goes four over, on the last two holes, I think she makes it into the finals. So she's clearly devastated and is specifically frustrated on hole 18. I mean, 17, a bogey. Okay. You can live with just knowing, Hey, I can get single or double or triple. And I move in, I go from that 2,500 to at least a a guaranteed 4,000. And when the hole was done after Jessica had gone out, OB multiple times, and the U disk eventually got completely updated oh, to you, no fault of U disk. Well, if you were watching U disk, it would ch- it changed scores probably four different times. Yeah, yeah, exactly, three or four different times. There was a number we thought was happening, we were unsure of. Then it got changed. Then it got changed yet again. It ended up settling on a nine. And you could hear some of the conversation of Jessica essentially trying to add the score and and what sounded like Katrina maybe second guessing, not necessarily, well, yeah, kind of second guessing a score that was spit out, but then also how to arrive at that score. It sounded like it was just a matter of philosophy for how Jessica, I think, likes to just add her scores uh, as as the throws and say, well, I'm I'm lying to throwing three. Oh, I went OB, so I'm throwing five or whatever. She likes to do it that way. Katrina, um, my understanding, likes to do as I do because I'm not I'm not very smart uh, on my part. I love to say, how many times did you throw the Frisbee? And then add the strokes at the end. That's how I personally the do OB it. I understand strokes. a lot of people will do it the other way, and that's fine too. However, you arrive at the right thing. I like to say, because I just think it's easiest, how many times did you throw it? And then what penalties need to be added on top of it? At any rate, it sounded as if there was just a discussion at how to arrive at the score, what the score was, and if there was, in fact, uh, pleasantries that went along with all of this. And and that was, by and large, the end of it. I think there was a scorekeeper, uh, the official scorekeeper of the event. He posted somewhere on Facebook saying, kind of basically rehashing everything I just said, and he said that there was a little bit of, um, what was the term you used? It, it was just, it got a little bit got a little uh, heated. heated. Got a little heated. In that overall exchange. And because I think that's all that's gonna that's all that's yeah, gonna come no. of it. Well, there was originally a post that said, and, and I don't know where this came from or why someone would even say this that it got heated, it almost came to blows, and Katrina could be suspended at the beginning of the year. Yeah, which a hundred percent false. Yeah, like, sounds it, like it never like way an exaggeration. It never came. My understanding is it never came close to coming to blows. It was just a little snippiness back and forth. There's. As we've said with the FPO division, it's a smaller division. You play with a lot of the same players over and over and over. At some point, and especially towards the end of the season, (laughs) everybody's well is empty. I'm sure you're sick of probably seeing 
the same person over and over and over. We've, we used to say it about the lead card of the MPO. Remember like, oh, everyone's always playing with the same four people. Like it's always Ricky and Paul and so-and-so and so-and-so and and just gosh, you'd think that, you know, they would just be sick of it. FPO is a smaller division and you just, it's an end of season, man. I, I don't fault really either of them. It's just, it's time to put the discs away. Yeah. Take a break. (laughs) Go to Mexico. Go to Mexico. (laughs) Lay on your bed. (laughs) (laughs) It's just the way it is, you know, and not everybody's going to get along. Not everybody has to be buddy, buddy and chummy, chummy. And, and you, 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 we all know, as I stuttered through it, we all know Katrina's had some struggles with her game that clearly impact her mentally. And I'm not making excuses for anyone, but the, Katrina's been op- open and upfront about all of that. And we've seen it on yeah. camera. And we also watched how Jessica frustratingly closed out the round. So you can understand emotions are probably, you know, all over the place for yeah. a lot of people. And, and again, no fists were thrown. <laughs> uh, whether or not somebody feels like this still is a is something you want to put on note, and maybe any one of the competitors sure. or card mates may say, "Hey, you know, just for the sake of having a paper trail, they may still submit it and document it." I wouldn't be opposed to that if you feel strongly enough about it, just to have it on paper. Um, I I don't think it's that big of a secret that a number of years ago, Jessica and Kat were very much at odds with one another a number of years ago, where it was seemingly a week in and week out thing for a little while. I feel like they've potentially buried that hatchet since then, and maybe some of that resurfaced or bubbled, and maybe it was all the situation. But having, having it on record might not be the worst thing either. Again, because they're likely going to play together at some point and you have something else to reference. But who knows? I, I'll say let's not get too, uh, wouldn't dwell too, too much worked on up on it. I, I will say I posted the payouts on Sunday and I said, does anybody have any thoughts on this? And as a what I would consider a pretty good sport, Jessica was one that replied to my Facebook. She was, in fact, the first person to reply and said, I said, does anybody have any thoughts on the payout here that's going to happen today and all these records and so on and so forth? What do you think about it? And she wrote, quote, I think I really blew it on 17 and 18 this week <laughs> with a facepalm emoji. Honesty. Yeah. And, I, and I, and I replied that. at that time <laughs> uh, just saying, certainly heartbreaking for you. Fuel to come back stronger next year. So, yeah. uh, But just the fact that she could, you know, own it. And, and uh, you know, as you said, the honesty. So. Nonetheless, nothing for nothing. Uh, congrats to Missy Gannon. Congrats to all the finalists or even the semifinalists that had an opportunity to be there, to be in the top 12 or the top 20. They all got 1500 bucks yeah. or whatever, 2500 to, to be To be there and to have that experience, I'll, I'll remind you, at one point, $1,500 was an insane payout for winning an FPO tournament. And now we have women that are showing up that have just, so to speak, made it. And with that, they're going to be walking home with $1,500 or $2,500 or whatever those numbers are. And then forty grand to go to Missy Gannon. Uh, incredible. And as I l- said with Ricky, the other quick note I'll, I'll put on that, even with winning only, in air quotes, uh, like nine or, or $10,000, Kristen goes on to still become our overall single season record record holder at like around $116,000. And I, I think that is awesome. I think it's even cooler that no, not only is she back to back as hundred thousand dollars plus, but the fact that she straight up just holds the record in MPO or FPO. I'll say the same thing I said last year. Odds are next year it'll be a new record. Sure, and, <laughs> and it'll great. be even cooler if it's her. <laughs> it, it, I know it's, it's great in general. I'm not I'm not uh, dismissing it in any means. It's just we're in an area, a time of the sport where it feels like things just continue to progress. And while we're not seeing a lot of the same interest jump levels that we saw during COVID times, it feels like we're still progressing. We're still there is still growth in the sport you know we're not seeing the double digit percentage growth that we saw the spike maybe we're just back to our normal what it used to be seven to nine percent or whatever it was of growth um and that might be fine i think the real question becomes and everyone you know can kind of sit on it is 
are these payouts sustainable? You know, the pro tour, the help of LL Bean, the help of as long as you have sponsors, Barbasol, there. you know, and the help of these yeah. people that we've had. Yes, are these numbers sustainable? You know, that we've worked so hard to see them. I think that is the big question. I think that is so tough. I think they're sustainable for these for like the tour championships because we're seeing some of these big sponsors come in. But it feels like the elite series events that keep pushing the envelope, it might be getting harder and harder to keep pushing that that payout up. Because I'll tell you what, we all know, like just like I just said, disc sales are down compared to the peak points in COVID. You can get discs now. And it might be getting harder and harder to, to say, for instance, going to Innova and saying, hey, man, we'd really like $35,000 for our tournament. Innova might just be like, Meh, I don't know, or Discraft or DD or whomever. I'm not just picking on one company, just anybody. Like that, Which is why it is very good and maybe even a requirement that we continue to seek outside sponsorship. And... And Sean Jack, and I, I'm putting a lot of it on him, is doing a great job. We're getting companies like, you know, LWS or Barbasol or LL Bean, all those uh, halal guys. Those are great outside sponsors. Hopefully we can continue to get them because I feel like without the outside sponsors, we're going to plateau because there's uh, 100%. You, you're, you're just, unless the sport continues to kind of, if, if we don't foresee it, maybe something big happens. The sport takes a couple more big jumps manufacturers are selling a lot more discs maybe then they'll put in more money into tournaments but you cannot expect our manufacturers to continue to push up the levels at which they sponsor events year over year over year unless they're seeing the returns and we don't see their books so i don't know for sure maybe they are maybe they they, they can afford to do this and you know they, they're looking at thirty five thousand dollars and going yeah we can really afford 50, but we'll just keep it at 35 for now. And next year we'll go 37 and then 30. I don't know the numbers, but uh, yeah, that's, I, I, I don't know if sustainable is um, possible. Possible. Uh, one other big note that we saw that was announced since last week's show um, was the fact that we're going to see three of our, our, our last three events to be, um, broadcast on the CBS Sports Network, and in some capacity, and I don't have it in directly in front yeah, of me. I think there's going to be an edited version of USDGC Throw Pink and the Tour Championship. I believe edited down probably to an hour. Put on the CBS Sports. Uh, there's you have got the announcement in front of you. My guess is that it's going to be very similar to what we've seen in the past, with like Bluefoot doing a lot of the stuff. Probably some sort of voiceover. A little some narrative you god help us if there's a 20 minute introduction to the sport of disc golf at the beginning of each one i will probably get very frustrated um but just in general hopefully you know a, a good clean explainer on the events yeah as you just said it, and they're set to air right now on uh, november 13th november 27th and december 11th i believe those are all monday night time slots please Please, disc golfers, remember, this isn't for you. Don't. Yeah, don't get all mad when they're not telling you, oh, this is Ricky's fourth run fell yeah, in. This, this, isn't, this isn't meant to be shot-by-shot <laughs> shot coverage. Nobody on CBS wants to watch shot-by-shot shot coverage of a final round. Yes. Or, like, that's not how we're selling the sport. This is to, yes. th Let's be honest. This is to sell the sport to sponsors, outside, commercials, and CBS or maybe ESPN in the future or whatever. This, yeah, this is a is, story that will have disc golf. You've already watched all it. these. You've already watched it. So <laughs> And you know what happened. Yeah, so you, you don't need to get all, all frustrated online. Oh, they will. And, and they I know will. they will. And yell like, oh, I can't believe they didn't show this or this. Or I didn't even know how Ricky got to that position. And yeah. it's like, ugh. So that that was announced last week, and uh, looking forward to seeing it. So, Anytime you have it on something of that scale, I know you're also going to complain. Some will complain and say, "Well, there still isn't such and such network with such and such, and it's up against football or whatever." Just just 
I, I think a good takeaway that I've really been trying to lean into as I see, you know, sometimes when you see a lot of criticisms, just take a little win and run with it. You don't always, and myself included, I you don't always have to find the, the, the singular most nitpicky and or, uh, you know, self-serving negative to every single announcement and thing that gets released. And I feel like, and, and it's not just disc golfers, clearly. It, it's all of us. But sometimes just take the little win. Just, like, give a little minor fist bump pump and be like, yeah, that's cool. And don't worry about, like, the, ne- the like really specific minor thing that then is not, self, you know, serving you. Well, it's, it's for the greater good. Let's continue to focus on the negative. <laughs> yes. Terry Miller. Um, you briefly brought up with Ricky the spectator situation. Yep. It feels like when you compare, and I, I don't have the numbers as to how many um, spectators there were out there, it didn't look like an outrageous number. It looked like pretty moderate. What do you think the Pro Tour can do? I don't want to say should, but can do if if they want to improve spectatorship at this event. It. it- it's uh, the, I think there's a couple of trains of thought. Thankfully, no one listens to me, so this is it doesn't matter what I say. But there is a couple well, of trains wait, of what, thought. What was that? I wasn't listening. Uh, I understand someone. So, someone even posted on our board with one kind of along those lines of, well, what if there was a week in between? That might give some people more breathing room. Somebody, somebody might be able to skip out of the office in Charlotte on Thursday and Friday to watch USDGC. And then the next week they can dare, but maybe if it was a week later, whatever. I mean, it, you, you, I know we're getting a little uh, specific there. I worry that that will lose more momentum than even before. And quite honestly, the players don't want that because you're not going to put another event in between there. We're already at the end of the year. Everybody is dying to go home. They just are. Everyone is ready to go home. And and that's crew, but that's even the players, more so the players. So having a week in between, I don't think that generates extra buzz or excitement, although it may reduce some of the USDGC hangover. One could argue, and I don't think this is, it's not going to happen in 2024. One could argue, could, the US, could this be before the USDGC? I. I was kind of, I was kind of thinking that. Kind of jump ahead of them and see if that steals any well, thunder. Or it may or may not. Just make, and my not my idea, but a thought. Why not make MVP the the tour finale? Make this, and and I don't know, you know, I don't know if you can have like so to speak the MVP Open sponsored by Barbasol and MVP discs powered by. I mean, we can do whatever we wanted, but do we need to have and make that the separate championship? Make that the championship weekend at Maple Hill. It, it, it feels like it's a great course. Sure. It's got some really good holes. It's iconic. It, it's, a, it's a place to be. You've, you've got spectatorship, things like that, as opposed to trying to cram. Because then you already have, a, at the end of the tour, at the end of everything, then you have a few weeks before USDGC. Uh, again, yeah. just an idea. Because I feel like putting it before USDGC, a week before, two weeks before, there at that point now you're almost out of time, um, is really difficult. You're still cramming everything at the end of the season. Yeah, I mean, and similarly, just like if you go back really old school, uh, to what year one or you two years one and two or year one, uh, what if GM GMC similarly could be the end of the season event, depending on the exact, you know, if that's middle of September. Uh, like MVP was this year, interchangeably, yeah, the conversation could be had. Uh, you'd almost like that conversation even more f- more so for uh, a smuggler's notch for the simple fact that you have the two courses and you have the two, so you have the two different styles, of course. And someone could say that's a, that's a tour championship that feels even more fair because somebody could say, well, is it as good as Maple Hill is and everybody loves it seemingly or the most part do. If you have it on the two courses that are uh, out at Smuggler's Notch, then you're definitely spreading, you know, some of the the challenge out. So e- either or, um, sure. I, I don't think that's not the dumbest idea you've ever stolen from someone else online. So I, I didn't steal that from anyone online. Honestly, I just I literally just thought of it a couple minutes ago. I've I've heard people say sauce. 
Oh, I've heard people saying move it to other places. Um, and I and I was just thinking, what places on the East Coast? And this year MVP was the final event. Is it going to be every year? We don't know. It could be Smugs. It could be MVP. Um, yeah. yeah. So something uh, like that. Anyway, so there, there's. Uh, uh, I mean, the Tour Championship at one point had ended at Smuggler's Notch. Correct. So. Um, those things come to mind. I don't know what ticket prices were like, if that was in I, fact anything that actually did, if it was a daily ticket price or, you know, or anything of that nature, or if the VIP tickets ended up being that much better that those were the only ones that were, that were really sought after, but yet they were really expensive. I, I don't know any of that. That's something they're going to definitely have to look at. And, and then I guess the next question is how, how much emphasis are we putting on having on site? And that's that was my other that's question. another question. If right? I said if they want, if the pro tour is okay with just having an event without big spectatorship for their championship, then great, keep doing what we're doing because the players don't seem to mind. They go to the event, the the thirty two men and the 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 sixteen women or 12, 24, 20. 24, whatever that number is, I forget. Um, they go, they collect a nice check. Some of them collect a very nice check, and then they finish their season. So, so if they don't care that there's not a ton of spectators there, which maybe they don't, because if you look at how USDGC is set up with the huge vendor village and all, like they know the number of people that are coming mm -hmm. ahead of time. The pro tour in theory should know that number as well. And if they're not looking to sit, like that would be very difficult. I think at Nevin to set up something like a vendor village that USDGC has to, to match because I feel like there's a soccer field you could put it on. <laughs> there is a soccer field with lines. Um, I think you could get a few food trucks out there and, and just have someone show up, but it's not going to be the same as, um, as the USDGC and almost anything after USDGC is going to look and feel inadequate compared to USDGC. But yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't know if that matters. Um, and then an, another comment that I saw was a, either people didn't understand the format, which I feel like of all formats, this is one of the easier ones to understand, uh, personally, after all the years that I've seen you, uh, the finals at the pro tour championships, this was the easiest to understand. But second of all, uh, one of the reasons that this format was adopted is so that all the best players would start out the week playing there. That was arguably one of the number one reasons this format was adopted because in oh, previous that didn't, that didn't do shit i'm just saying in previous <laughs> years people would say hey i'm not yeah. i don't have a reason to be out there as much on say thursday and friday no. because paul and ricky and calvin and those guys had buys so they weren't there until the weekend and so that was part of it along with the players themselves saying we don't necessarily love the buys yeah we would rather be out there and get a competitive round in on Thursday and Friday heading into the weekend. Now, of course that, that doesn't I, work out for I every believe. single player and it didn't, but that's part of the overall conversation is people having less interest in being there early in the week. If the top players weren't there, I never bought that. I never bought. So when people said it outright, you, you still don't buy it. No, I don't. Okay. I don't buy like Sure, there are probably some individual people that are like, yeah, I'd rather see Paul and Ricky, whatever. But to me, I don't think that was a a huge... We have so many good players and personalities now over the last three to five years that I felt like, okay, cool. Yes, Paul particularly, as well as Ricky now, I think even a little bit less, they have a following that people want to see them. They want to see the best. Mm -hmm. And sure, I mean... Did people not come because Paul wasn't there this year, this year? Maybe. I mean, that's, that's I'm sure not, there was some, I'm sure there was some grouping of do, people. Is what, is it a thousand people? No, no, no. So I don't think that that, the fact that the, that the top players weren't playing because I tell you what, top players were still there. They just weren't competing. They were probably there early walking around practicing. Maybe they're after practicing. If you wanted to see them, you might've been able, they might even have been there signing discs. I don't think that that was a huge deal for the, the Thursday and Friday of the event. I think it has more to do, as we've said, with USDGC and people taking their vacation. If you're going to go to an event, 
you're going to go to USDGC. If you're going to take time off, that's the event you're going to do it for. Well, certainly. But the question is, Saturday and Sunday, most people aren't working. Why weren't there more people there Saturday and Sunday to me? Like, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe it's USDGC, burnout. Maybe maybe it's anything. But I, I, I never particularly bought the idea that there were, we weren't getting huge crowds because the top players weren't playing. I don't think I don't and, think it was a matter of huge and, crowds, or that's and, ex- solely a re- the reason. And I know some of the players they preferred to play. I'd love to know the the numbers, and I don't know if we'll ever know of players that liked the buys versus didn't like the buys. Yeah, that's a good question because as Simon probably would have liked to buy into the into the finals. Um, I, I don't know. It seemed I, like I, most of them didn't from yeah, what we've and, and heard. I'm okay with that. If the play if this is the way the players want it to play, then I'm all for it. It to me, I don't really care who plays what rounds. But as I said, we have so many good personalities these days. Yeah, but I I, I, I don't I don't I don't I, think it matters. I do think it does matter for the simple fact that people still go to an NBA game and when so and so isn't in the lineup, they're all pissed off. When when somebody sure. comes goes to a, if I went to a Milwaukee Bucks game and I I wouldn't get this way cuz I'm not a passionate fan, <laughs> but if I went to a Milwaukee Bucks game and and, Giannis, uh, and Gian, 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 yeah. Giannis, yeah yeah yeah, Giannis, I'm a big fan. Uh Clearly. didn't play. I wouldn't. I personally wouldn't be pissed off again. I'm a bad example, but I, I there's people that get really ticked I, off. Yep. Same thing, of course, in all of our professional st- sports. Yeah. When someone's sitting out or not playing for any given reason, whether uh, it's a coaching decision or just a organizational decision that they're not playing, the fans are mad about it, and so oh, yeah. fans want to be able to have the opportunity to see and. I think that factored in. I don't think it was the number one factor to changing the format. I don't even either. think it was a major factor, but I think it, it's a, it I definitely think it's was a, a factor. I think it's a very minor factor. But. So, nonetheless, uh, I guess we'll see, and we'll see. Uh, we said it earlier. I don't know. Moving it? Do you think moving it out of Charlotte is a good idea? Further away from Rock Hill? Is it like Atlanta? as funny as it sounds? That might be the an- that might be a and very legitimate answer. Go- going to Atlanta, going to Florida, having going- a different user or a different uh, spectator base that's maybe a little fresher that Mm -hmm. isn't going to have a USDGC USDGC hangover, that absolutely might be the answer. Atlanta's like five, no, whoa, USDGC? No, Atlanta's not that far. You know, going over to 10, I was thinking like like, going over to Tennessee or into Kentucky maybe, somewhere somewhere where it's within a few few hours. But to check all the same boxes that the Charlotte Club does is are very, very big shoes to fill. That's why we've been there. (laughs) Yep, and they are phenomenal. And I would never, ever question them. I'm just wondering if, you know. I mean, we've seen it in Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, is the other main place, and that, we've seen that was pre te- that was pre COVID. That mm-hmm. no one was even thinking of spectators really at that point. Yeah, like, it was. It, it, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was and an, Smuggler's Notch when it was there was also it was an afterthought. Spectators. You know. Everyone expected about fifty people. <laughs> yeah, and the fact of even having in in uh you know w- there's a lot of. Uh, it's not a secret that going up to Smuggler's Notch for a weekend isn't inexpensive either. No. So th- there's all these different pros and cons, and you want it to be warm enough so we're not being threatened with snow. So there's a certain region and section of the country uh, of which it's really possible, and without being too far from Rock Hill either. You're, you're not going to have the finals over in Phoenix nope. after just playing in Rock Hill. So, again, a lot more smarter people are in charge of those decisions that aren't named Terry or Johnny. No, and well, uh, we can give our opinions. That's what we do. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's yeah, our, whether they want them or not, no, whether they want them or not. This is literally our job. <laughs> um, last, uh, next year, of course, the champions cup is listed in Appling, uh, to be held in Georgia at the end of October. And two weeks prior to that, as in the week after USDGC currently still the pro tour, uh, championship is slated for Charlotte, North Carolina for 2024. Hmm. Or, I wonder what format they're going to pick. I wonder, <laughs> just it changes every year. And I don't, we, I don't care the way I'll be watching we it shall or see. directing it or doing something. But uh, uh, do you want to talk about other news, Terry? Miller? Yeah. What other news do we need to, uh, some of the big business news that was announced as we mm. talked about with Ricky Discmania was officially purchased 
acquired by House of Discs. That's the same company that owns Latitude, that owns Castaplast, that owns Dynamic Discs. Now, technically, not technically, now, Discmania is under their umbrella as part of their branding, so to speak. So we now have a a, a conglomerate, so to speak, of disc manufacturers. I reached out to our good friend, Dana, and just said, hey, does this affect you at all? How are you doing? Um, and he said, currently, no, it doesn't. He's just, you know, he's going to continue to grind away and happy he still has a job and all that other good stuff. And, you know, and as from their perspective, it doesn't really change anything Right now, he says, who knows what's going to happen in five or 10 years. You know, maybe House of Discs goes public. Maybe they don't. Maybe they just grow the sport and kind of stay as a as private equity for a while. At this point, nobody knows what their plan is, um, what their long-term plan. There are very few people probably do. But um, I wish they'd. Can they buy us? Can somebody? No, I said. Please. That they can buy Skip Ace for a few milli. Oh. Yeah. Smashbox is not for sale. Skip base. Yes, though. it is. Smashbox Skip-base has a fifty percent owner. <laughs> Smashbox is for sale. I can say that. Uh, it's really cheap. <laughs> Trust me, it's real cheap. Yeah, we'll give you a real good deal. Yeah, yeah that's right. On and, this. Yeah. Just so give, just we just give us some good salaries every year, and we'll sit and do this. We'll even maybe do more podcasts if you mm, just get salaries. That's what they want. That's what that's what everybody wants. But anyway, House of Discs now owns. So it brings in some interesting questions. We are getting into the off season. Mm. We're going to see a few players that are have their contracts up for renewal. Eagle, Kyle as well. I don't think I so. Know, I think no. Kyle resigned through like twenty twenty six. Um, Eagle and Gannon, I think, are the two real big names that we're talking. Mm-hmm. Does someone like? We'll just say a. Uh, we'll just say a latitude. Does that now limit our players' movement abilities that maybe, and we used to see it kind of hinted at it with Innova and Discmania, that the players never really went back and forth between those two companies because they were cousins, so to speak. Well, now we're they're a little closer. I would say they're siblings between Latitude, Discmania, DD. Do we not see Eagle have an opportunity maybe to go to one of these other companies because they would not try to poach him, so to speak, from one of the parent, one of the other sibling companies. So have we now, in theory, not we, but is there a restricted free agency for some of these players? Limit more limit more limited options. Like or does House of Disc just say, guess what? Eagle, you're gonna, you know, that's fine. You can go to Latitude. But there's no longer probably a bidding war. Why that wouldn't make sense as to why Latitude would try to outbid disc mania or eagles uh, services it would and it wouldn't because you still have those they're individual uh, brands exactly still. you still have them as individual brands and i think that would be one of the conversations yeah when you have a, the overall same parent owner so to speak though yeah you're right it feels counterintuitive to say oh hey latitude will offer x and then this mania comes over and says, well, I'll offer X plus Y to keep you. Mm-hmm. I, I, that's a good question. And, and does that make other brands, if that's the case, does that make other brands outside of the house of Dis that much more, I don't want to say lucrative or, or competitive appealing. or appealing. Maybe um, if you're on the outside of not being in, in part of house of Dis, you know, namely your for now, your, for now <laughs> your Innova and your Discraft are the two big ones that come to mind that aren't part of it. Yeah. W- w- will there be more or less bargaining power or not? But there's also probably something to be said about being underneath that overall umbrella of house of Dis, where there might be other intrinsic or or back end deals or values that somehow are worth more maybe that you know kind of counter that i that that's a really good question or, or are we going to see you know and i don't know if this is even possible i'm sure everything's possible a player sponsored by house of discs that can then throw anything in the brand sure you know it, cool eagle is the quote unquote, the first player to be sponsored by House of Discs. And he can throw anything from Discmania to Latitude, DD, 
mm -hmm. Castaplast, whatever else they make. <laughs> um, I'd be curious to see if we're going to see anything like that. And then that his salary, so to speak, doesn't hit any individual brand. Yeah. Their bottom line. I don't know if that's truly a possibility, if that's anything that they're looking at, but I was thinking that today that are we going to see less options for players when they're all, when, when half of, half of our major brands are under one umbrella now, mm -hmm. you know, so now you've got Discraft, Innova, House of Discs. Like those are your really MVP. Those are your really big manufacturers that are vying for players. Obviously, Lone Star is still out there. Legacy is still out there. We've got uh, Thought Space is still doing things, but you know, these are all companies that, well, Thought Space still has their disc manufactured by somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, Infinite does the same thing, has their disc manufactured by someone else. I, I'm curious to see what it does to the market in general and, and what we're, what we're going to see. Um, Maybe yeah. Smashbox should start making Frisbees. Who's, who would make our Frisbees? No, we make them. Let's get some injection molders. Ooh. Just it, start with one. Would one fit down here in this room? Uh, yeah, no, people would. But if we could, <laughs> <laughs> the machine itself would fit. Okay. A uh, small one. We could get to fit. We just couldn't work it on either we the left or right okay, side well, of it. We'd be, <laughs> out of, we'd be out of luck. I mean, I've got a basement. There's a garage. We could put it in your garage. I don't know. I mean, I this were molded in garages uh, they, for quite a few yeah. years. I've, I've visited a few of them. Oh, I, so I don't want it in my garage, particularly because I like to park in my garage in the winter. Oh. So I mean, we, we'll be fine with temperature cooling <laughs> when discs <laughs> come out, uh, and it's 102 in Wisconsin, and then uh, six months later, it's it's negative, know, negative 10. yeah, negative <laughs> ten. Our our quality, our consistency will be through the roof. It will be like you've it. never seen before. That's for sure. <laughs> we need some ventilation. Eh. Oh, really? OSHA's oh, not visiting us. We'll be just fine. Don't don't you worry about our operation. Yeah, you keep your nose to yourself, there, Ray. Uh, don't, the, don't, the, don't the you Smashbox call OSHA operation. Us. Uh, the other big news that we saw today, and I did not process all of it, uh, but long and short of it is that the results of public comment on proposed rule changes for 2024 have hit the PDGA. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about, in fact, I'm going to put it in the but, chat as we speak. Most of the things that we talked about earlier in the season just got pushed through. Um, players, the major one, I think, is players. Every player needs to keep score now, right? That's one of the big yes, ones. Yes, and you also do not have to be a member to play in a C tier, I feel like that was one of the other big ones that kind of got, I guess, negated in a, in a better, for lack of a better phrasing. Um, talking about uh, your speed of play, I think that was discussed uh, in terms of what your 30 seconds looks like. I heard somebody say that that got more clarified. Um, I'm just kind of scrolling real quickly to see if there's anything else. Uh, one of the big ones, too, if a player is... Uh, le later deemed to be absent for the first hole, uh, misplay, blah, 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 does not apply. The only the player receives it for being absent. There was one along the lines you of... You need to check in five minutes yeah. before your tee time with a PDGA official, I think, at the uh, at your... Basically at at the events scene. using a staggered start with scheduled tee times, players must also check in with the starter no less than five minutes prior to their tee time each day. Players who do not check in with the starter by this time receive two penalty strokes. How does, so essentially your, how does that work with a B -tier? your like, two minutes becomes your five minutes. <laughs> you know, a two-minute warning yeah. like we used to have. In a, uh, not really. But yeah, you, you now have essentially you're on notice five minutes prior to your tee time. What do you mean with a B tier? I mean, if it has a staggered start. Yeah, like you may not have a starter at a B tier. It might just be show up to your T. You at... have a starter. No, 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 because it's you... staggered start. It's not yeah. shotgun. I know. So you you have to have somebody. Really, you can't just say, "All right, players, you're teeing at at nine oh five. Just show up and tee off if, at nine If you don't, you're do you are doing it wrong. I I, I understand because they have but... to have like all the scoring information, which I guess maybe went out in an email. I just can't imagine not having a starter if you're doing like literally somebody like, should be standing there you would think so but i mean it's a b tier you've run b tiers with and people. i can't imagine not and none like, of them, none of them I, probably have probably been. you would still you would need a starter like you would think yeah but. anyway so that that is uh one that was kind of there um <laughs> 
<laughs> Ace Run. We'll talk about that in the after show. <laughs> um, so anyway, those are out there. Proposed rule changes. I guess the long and short of it for me is the PDGA set out what they were going to do to change rules, uh, you know, kind of all the proposed rules changes. Then they had an open forum where people could submit their feedback. People submitted feedback. A lot of people just talked real loudly and bitched and moaned and complained and probably didn't do anything. But some people, it's God bless you, some people took their feedback right, wrong, or indifferent, took their feedback, provided it to the PDGA. The PDGA listened to said feedback and, and probably swayed and, and uh, you know, was influenced by said feedback. And then now is moving forward with some rules changes. Like kind of a beautiful, not, not philosophy, just a, 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 a process, a beautiful a process, process. Yeah. as to how it can and should go. And if you didn't provide feedback, now you may have provided feedback and they, they still may not have gone that way. Clearly, if 50 people sent in something one way and, and 51 people sent it in another, just because the 51 sent in doesn't mean it necessarily went that way. But the point is there was the opportunity to provide some feedback. They listened to feedback and it looks like they've made some significant adjustments to what they had originally proposed. I don't know if you can ask for too much more than that. So... Um, and I don't get paid by the PDGA to say any of that. I just feel like that seems like a pretty logical <laughs> adult like way to move forward with it. So, uh, there we go. Uh, Darren said, I've played without a starter. We expected someone to be there, but no one showed up. So we just like teed two minutes after our tea time. Uh, I get it. I just personally, if I'm going to go through the effort of hosting an event that is a staggered start event i can't imagine not either me or someone else like you're doing a poor job like i'm just gonna say that you are doing a piss poor job of running your tournament if you're having staggered starts with tea times and you don't have someone there officially starting them off so what happens if you don't show up five minutes before your tea time i just starter? said you get a two-stroke penalty so I, I here's what i'll say that is gonna go that that's that's gonna work just fine for major events i i would be hard pressed to see if we'll ever see a stroke from a b tier i just i can't imagine i feel like it should happen once and then you'll learn your damn lesson uh, so and again here's what i'll say you're the starter because you're it's your b tier terry mm -hmm. group shows up one guy shows up two minutes before the tea time not five minutes but two minutes he's there in plenty of time you're stroking him sorry you're getting you struck. should i know you should per but, the rules you but, should but I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe, especially in year number one, I, I, when I, I send out my notes the day before the tournament yeah. and I say, hey, everyone, excited to have you. There's 200 of you tomorrow. In big, bold letters for maybe the second or third or fifth time, I say, please remember, yep. check in with the starter no less than five minutes before so that we, we are all accounted for. And if, if you, I just don't see these it. people are mostly adults uh, mostly. or they're accompanied by one well, usually. I just don't see, uh, I see this as a, um, in a kind of a fallback to something. Obviously, with the the Luke Humphreys issue that we had this year, mm -hmm. like this is probably almost almost in direct relation to it. More than likely, a response to it. I just don't think anyone's going to do it. Like I think everyone mostly will, people will show up five minutes for. But I think that if someone doesn't check in. And rolls in three minutes before or two minutes before. As long as they're not late to their tea, I kind of feel like... You just have to pretend like late to your tea now means four, <laughs> four minutes and 59 seconds like shy I, of it. Like it I tell means my wife, you're late like to your not, tea. If we're not five minutes early, we're late. Yeah. So I, <laughs> so, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I just agree. I, Somebody I no will be problem. made example of, wait till, it gets, wait till it happens on a big event early and then somebody's made an example of it like sure. some yeah. high profile player uh, darren Eck has a good point can i can i show up an, an hour early and say i'm here walk i would yeah that's at least and your then, five minutes you've checked in with the starter and then not show up until like literally it's your turn to <laughs> i would assume the starter should in some capacity either a remember or b put a little dot next to your name yeah. it's like oh i saw ricky yep ricky was here he was here two hours early that's fine but you, you are to check in with the starter and be there at least five minutes out. It says, and be there, right? That's uh, what you're saying. 
again, if I if I check in 10 minutes early, but then wander away. I'll read it again. Yeah, read it again, and then show up. At A-tier events using... This, at A-tier This, this says A-tiers, okay. but... So, uh, so this wasn't... Even at A-tier events think. using a staggered start with scheduled tee times, players must also check in with the starter no less than five minutes prior mm -hmm. to their tee time each day. Sure. Players who do not check in with the starter by this time receive two penalty throws. This is recommended for staggered starts with scheduled tee times at uh, for staggered starts with scheduled tee times at all other tiers. I just think it's it's funny because like someone said, I I, sh I show up that morning, an hour before my tee time, I walk over to the starter, be like, I'm here, and then you wander away. Yeah, and, and all the players then are are walking up to the tee. Now teeing, Terry Miller. Terry Miller tees. Everyone's looking around like, oh, that's weird. John hasn't showed up. Yeah. John hasn't now showed teeing. up. Now teeing. Now teeing somebody else. Then John just kind of walks up and is like, yeah, I'm here. Like it just, it would be. It's a I mean, in theory, you should also be there you to should. watch your card mates throw. That's yeah, part of the rules. That's part of the rules. Yep. Yeah. So. I mean, I'm just saying that there's, it's weird. It's, it's I don't I don't think it's as weird. And and truth be told, let's be real here. I, as much as we've already beat yeah. this to death. Oh, yeah. Truth be told, most players, most 90 plus percent already want to be there 5 yeah. minutes ahead. Oh, yeah. This isn't not this is not much of a stretch. No, it's if not. 30 minutes. I'm just poking holes at this If point. 30 minutes was the requirement, you have a different discussion. Well, we're talking about five minutes prior to your tee. I don't think that's crazy as an expectation, personally. Yeah. Uh, chiming in on the board is Eagle McMahon, actually. He says he just got home, and he's about to go to sleep. Uh, maybe he'll join in uh, to the podcast in the next week or two. So that would be great. I know Eagle had talked about uh, some sort of shoulder surgery uh, for, I think, an impinge impingement. Something along those lines. So obviously, <laughs> Is labia should... the right word? What? I'm just kidding. What did you say? <laughs> no, I don't, whatever you said, I don't think it's the right word, Terry. <laughs> um, uh, and uh... <laughs> arm, arm. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> no, okay, no, guess not. No, I couldn't think of it. That's fine. that's probably not it. No, let me let me Google it. Should I Google it? Yeah, it, it, it impinged labia. Impinged labia. Impinged? That was I. I didn't remember hearing that word. Impinged? How do you spell that? Uh, I m p i n g e d. Labrum is that is that the word? I don't know what it is. Labrum in, would make sense. Impinged. Yeah. Oh, shoulder. Hey, <laughs> is that the yeah. right part of the no, body? The the correct term is labrum. Labrum. Yes. See, that's not, why I'm not, not a doctor. Not, yeah, not labia. <laughs> that is a completely different part of the body, Terry. See, this is this is the only reason that kept me from being a doctor is I couldn't remember the words. Yeah. Well, I I, either way, for your impinged labrum, we wish you the best, Eagle. And uh, when you when you labral any, tears. Yes. That's totally <laughs> Oh, guys, this is my co-host. This is my friend for 30 years. And I still... Uh, I think I got it figured out. That's... Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Woo! All right. Woo. Anyway. Um, yes. So, Eagle, we wish you the best. Anyway. Um, Be safe. Another announcement, even though we did make this... We did break the news last Tuesday. Yes. The exclusive. The, the exclusive news. If you were here, you heard it first. Uh, Pablo... Genesis, Macbeth, they made a, a formal announcement with a few posts this week. Um, and we wish you nothing but the best, Paul and Hannah. Of course, we told you that last week when we broke the news. Gosh. Um, now the internet's no. Now everyone knows. Couldn't keep it a secret for that long. No. <laughs> Dan says you have to uh, speak Latin. Oh, that's that's not how, happening either. I don't think so. Um, yeah, any... Yeah, Eagle said on the 26th or 27th, I was just thinking of when he said his surgery is, which is coming up in like a week or two. I I think what was the maybe the big takeaway from him announcing that, uh, A, that it was happening, but then B, I think his exact phrasing was, 
it's almost a an elective surgery at this point. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I know that Eagle has gone through all of these different approaches and these, I don't want to say attempts, but all these different strategies for how to get this under control and, and possibly get it fixed. Well, good luck. And, yeah, and I don't I mean, mean that in a negative way. I mean, like, good luck just because yeah. we just know that this has been an ongoing issue for so long. Yeah. And hopefully this is maybe the, the thing that, I don't want to say ends it, but yeah, I guess that's the best way to put it. Ends the any kind of pain or any kind of discomfort or just, yeah, frustrations that go along with it. Yeah. Because there's probably always a certain degree, especially with someone who throws so hard, there's probably a certain degree of just sheer hesitation with damn near any throw when you're in that much pain and you're talking about or you've been in that much pain and then you're always just constantly thinking in the back of your mind, oh man, if I did this, could I potentially re-injure myself? So and, whatever- and in general, any yeah. surgery has the potential for complications. So we're, like we said, we're hoping for nothing but the best for Eagle. Yeah. And, and we'll we'll catch up and definitely uh, figure out what to, how that went and what's going on. So- when when he when he joins the show and he has no arm, well, no, <laughs> it's like I'm gonna throw lefty guys. I guess that'll answer that question, yeah, won't no it? Um, and this sad part is for the rest of the world is it, it wouldn't probably take long for him to become a proficient a proficient lefty thrower as well. Oh God, he's he. Already I mean, I know is, he already yeah, can, he already but I'm just can. saying, like, like fully compete left-handed. Yeah. And we saw what Will Schusterick obviously had done uh, at the USDGC as well with now being able to putt lefty, uh, just. In, insane it would be crazy it would be crazy all right is there any uh the other quick news that we can reference as much as i didn't do uh the research i would have liked to long and short of it though is udisc has officially announced their own rating system ratings and we should just have them on i feel like i, I almost reached out earlier today I think very soon we should have them on and discuss it more in depth and what people think of it, how they arrived at it. I'm sure there's uh, obviously articles and things written about it. It would be great to get one of them to give us their actual take on it. But long and short of it is UDISC is essentially announced their own rating system that comes with using UDISC. I think it's only with UDISC Pro. Correct. Is what I saw. I know I got an email and I think for it. The, the ratings are different than the PDGA ratings. It's a different scale. Co- yeah, completely. It goes from like, Zero to I think three hundred, four hundred. Mm. I think, Shows I, think what if, we know. I think if you're around three hundred or right about there, then you're almost pro level. So I don't know how high that goes to be honest, but I, I believe if you're around three hundred, it you're, you're at like pro level. But it can go. I think it can go higher than. 300. Let me read you just a few bullet points because oh, I, I got the email God, here today. So what you need to know. UDISC round ratings are only available to UDISC Pro subscribers. That's me, it says. That's me too. Round ratings are powered by AI using a model that has been trained on millions of rounds scored with the app. The system is based on holes and courses, not a field of tournament players, which is very different from the PDGA's, uh, one of the main core components of the PDGA rating. The scale is 1 to 300 plus, providing benchmarks for everyone for beginners to pros. And then it goes on to later say 100 is great for a beginner, 200 more experience, 300. Elite performance will performances will trend from the 250s and up with 300 plus representing the kind of performance legends are made of. So there you go. Which, Wait, you didn't use the PDGA ratings? And it goes on to talk no. about that. So PD- we'll, we'll break it down more and have that discussion. I, actually, I'd be kind of interested to go out and maybe use it one of the maybe even this week, but uh, that is new. Uh, I'll give it a week or two. I'll be excited to really get a lot more feedback from people and see what they think of it. Uh, and someone, I saw someone say that they had scored a few rounds and they felt like a 200 was about a, a PDGA 900 is kind of right around there. Obviously not one for one, but kind of close to what they equated. Like he's like, I shot and I know what this course is. I know what the ratings generally are. I scored about a 900 PDGA. It gave me a 200 in UDISC. It, it also means you need to make sure to keep your course accurate. Like I think about Dretzka Park where, you know, you you could just put threes for everything and not care about whether, oh, which position is this in? If you care about your rating, your UDISC rating, you want to make sure that that's accurate because, you know, a 200, 
a 220 foot shot is going par three is probably going to be scored way different than a 330 foot par three that goes pushes back and into the woods and off to the left and it's a way different par three so looking at you know if it truly does look at each individual hole and how it's scored those scores are going to be way different and your your quote unquote rating would be different so make sure if you're scoring with U disc, you double check that the pins are in the right position based on your course. And yeah, it, I think of the simplicity of that for like a nearby course to us is like Sussex. It has yeah. 18 tees and 18 pins, nothing changes. Then you compare and contrast that to Dretzka Park, as you just mentioned. There's 13 long tees. Or, yeah, 13 long tees. Maybe even more. 18 <laughs> regular tees. And then every pin as anywhere between one and five positions. So there's a, this infinite combo of what that course could look like on any given day or week. And uh, the, the, clearly, I, I don't know how you just uh, entirely does all of those details, but AI, just, the, you, bro. just the fact though, that there's, you know, those two courses couldn't be any more different in terms of the capabilities out there. At, at some point, if you want to be really smart, and maybe they've already done it somewhere, there's going to be a, a direct comparison mm -hmm. chart or scale of like, oh, hey, this two this 210, you know, really is almost right on par with being a, a, a 920 rated round and so on and so yeah. forth. I think what's really another additional thing that's cool about this is with the emphasis that has been put on PDGA ratings, this will give everyone some alternative to look at. And maybe some people will gravitate to it. Maybe, maybe. they won't. Maybe they will. You know, this will be exclusively U disc, and that's all it will get talked about. <laughs> I just think of all the other. Oh, is there going to be end of the year award for U disc uh, high rating and all these other things? But well, no, no. But I bet you, just like we see with Spotify at the end of the at the end of the year when you get your Spotify thing, like oh, you listen to th five thousand minutes of Britney of Taylor Spears. Swift. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Taylor. Yeah, yeah Taylor. Taylor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Taylor. I listen to her. <laughs> um, I bet you they will give that will be added into your U disc because I think they've done that in the past sure. as well. Throw it into your U disc stuff. Yeah, I, it, uh, it, good for them. Awesome to see. Um, and as someone else pointed on the board, I think it was Carney said, Disc Golf Metrics has had this for years. Uh, yeah, I've seen that. I've gotten a Disc Golf Metrics uh, score uh, once or twice in the past myself or rating. I don't know how they arrive at their ratings, uh, how similar or different. I feel like they're on a thousand point, thousand ish like base scale as well, um, and that they're and, their and own version of like they're more similar to the PDGA rating system than what this is. And I don't know, but if yes, I know they offered as well. Adjusts for different course. I know I'm 973 rated on metrics. I know. <laughs> it's because you haven't probably scored on there. Don't worry forever. about it. Don't worry how many. <laughs> uh, I, I got a 1,001 rating uh, the last round that I played using disc golf metrics. Okay. Way to go. So I, th I'm 1,000 rated now. That's what I'm going to tell everybody. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a really good round. Um, but yes, I did get a 1,001 rating. Way to go, Terry. Yeah, I'm telling everybody that now. That's, good yeah. call. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you really should do. What are you rated, bro? 1,001 for one what, round on oh, metrics? Yeah. Anyway. Mm. Uh, do you use it in Europe? Yes, I used it. I used it in Estonia. I also uh, was introduced to it in Australia uh, way back in like 2018 is when I was personally introduced to Disc Golf Metrics. And I know they've been using it. At one point, Disc Golf Metrics was the back end for USDGC. Correct, because that was the World Tour year. Exactly. When, when UC was doing uh, the Disc Golf World Tour they decided to use metrics for USDGC, which honestly, to this day, um, the one cool thing about metrics that I, I, that everyone seemed to love was the scorecard with the Instagram videos linked right yeah, in. Yeah, connection to connection, it. Or right to Instagram or Twitter or wherever it went. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people really, really liked that. And uh, and it would, you know, I'm not going to tell UDISC that that's what they should do, but it would be cool if they could somehow link that together but, yeah I, I, but it's a lot of work and and i know uh the world tour had like a specific person just dedicated to to bringing in those photos and tagging them and attaching them and it's more work than probably it's worth yeah it, but disc golf metrics is a very very legitimate uh hardcore high-end scoring system that gets used yeah, in most places outside of the u.s uh it, and that's something else that i also learned recently is if you're looking and this is maybe my pro tip we can close out on the night if you're looking for events 
to play in outside of the US. Disc golf scene, nor U disc are probably your solution. Your best bet is to go out and, and look at discgolfmetrics.com. Uh, that, that is where, again, uh, almost all of Europe and I think most countries are, have adopted it. So uh, for now, that could change. Some, somebody's going to take over somebody else. Who knows? Should we start a scoring company? Let me think. No. All right. I'm going to sell it to I'm selling my half of the, the company to the person that wants to start it uh turning your, smash your box into smash a score cut. Yeah. No, no. I don't think I don't think Ricky will lend me 40 grand. <laughs> that will not scratch the surface. <laughs> All right. Well, then with scratching surfaces, let's call it. We've got a smash box uh, after show that'll come to you maybe on the shorter side, but we're going to have that for you tonight, which will include and feature a giveaway, of course, as they all do for our Patreon subs. Another thing before I, I go is, should we do what the Pro Tour and a number of other companies are doing, uh, have done, is make our chat uh, exclusive to subscribers. No, uh, I don't know. I like that idea. I mean, I think you should sub to us. Oh, I mean, ju- okay. Our ju- chat here on YouTube, just subscribers. Yeah, I would. I that would, you have to subscribe to us in order to then. I would not. Chat. Be, I would not be opposed to that. Yes, um, because it doesn't cost anything to be a subscriber. I know there's a few pages where it actually costs you money to be a subscriber. Mm. And, no, I no, I don't want that. But and and so th- there was some blowback from uh from some podcasts where it was like. Well, I can't chat unless I pay you or something weird like that. No, but just to just be a subscriber, I would actually be okay. Is that too with much that. to ask? I don't know. I don't think it is. All right. You guys probably all are, so it probably wouldn't even affect you. But maybe, maybe not. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. It was awesome to catch up with Ricky Waisaki. I'll make sure to fully dox him when I get to his house. <laughs> or you guys, I could show it off to you guys so you guys know exactly what you're renting when you take the Airbnb uh, tour over there. Uh, so thank you to him. Congrats again to Missy Gannon. I had reached out uh, a couple times with Richie. Uh, Richie, wow. Rich, with Missy. Me, me we went back and forth. There was a, 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 a slight lapse there. I know she's traveling, understandably. I think she also was with Nick and Matt last night, so hopefully she uh, gave you guys a lot of good insight there. Congratulations. She's welcome to join us anytime if she'd like. We'll we'll take her after a big win or otherwise. It doesn't matter. Anytime she wants. For Johnny V, I'm the Disc Golf Guy. And for Ricky Waisaki, our pro tour champion this weekend. Congrats to him. We're going to stand down for just a moment. Then we'll see you in the after show when you step inside the Smashbox. Thank you to our $2 and above patrons. Your name is listed below in the credits. If you are interested in being listed as a producer in the Smashbox TV credits and supporting this and other fine podcasts, please visit patreon.com slash smashbox TV. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV Podcast 476's After After Show. Oh.
nailed it. Just together. How we do it. Woo! Here we are. Welcome in, everyone. In case you don't know what the after show is, it is a long-winded display of Johnny V's beautiful voice and singing talents. I just sing. I take requests from the chat <laughs> on the song, uh-huh. and I sing it. That's the whole after show now. <laughs> It's, just turn into the Johnny V karaoke hour. Oh God, yes. Except for we don't give you any music. Like no, we don't just, have an it's under. A, it's all acapella. Yeah, just just me. Yeah, we could go with that. Well, that'd welcome be, in. That'd the, be a quick way to, to lose, end the after to, show. To lose all of our subscribers. Yeah. Well, welcome in everyone. This is the after show where we'll talk about yeah, not quite anything, but close to it. Anything and everything that you really want to bring to us that may or may not be disc golf related. We generally will steer clear of uh, most religion politics, uh, things of that nature. But for the most part, anything goes otherwise. Uh, or we may completely dive right back into a disc golf conversation. Mildly related to disc golf, um, Ace Run Pro brought up a very funny thing that happened this particular weekend about with our producer, uh, Mahmoud Barani. <laughs> In case you want to know his name before we <laughs> trash him. Mo, everyone calls him Mo. But uh, uh-huh. we were, I forget what day it was. It might have been day two, two. I feel like. We were showing shots of the crowd. There was a, this. Crowd shots. Crowd, crowd work. We do that. We do that. There was a cute little girl, probably, you know, five, six, seven, something like that in the crowd. And there's kind of an, always an internal joke that I think it's fun to show kids in the crowd. And Mo always wants to show animals in the crowd. Mm. And that's like that's like our, our always our fight between the two of us. If if he sees a dog, he he you know even the cameraman know. Hey, let's show this dog. Mo loves to see animals. I'm I always think it's fun to show kids the future, whatever. And so we show this we show this young girl, and you're like, oh look at this look at this cute kid. And Mo jokingly says, um, yeah, I've seen cuter. Completely. Joking. This is internal. This is all internal in our comms. Of course. I hear it in my ear as yep. I'm as I'm broadcasting. As you're broadcasting. Just to find out like 20, not even 20, like three seconds later, Felix, the cameraman from Ace Run Pro, jumps on the on the call and goes, Oh, hey guys, you that's my daughter. <laughs> and and Mo at this point was just about to go on another joking, like, like, ah, oh, kids, yeah, definitely. Definitely not the cutest kid I've ever seen. Like he was go- about to kind of go into a, a, a short joking diatribe, and I'm here going, Mo, 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 please stop, Mo. <laughs> so, and then afterwards, Mo, Mo goes just to me. He's like, Johnny, why didn't you warn me? I didn't know it was Felix's kid. I, you know, I just knew that. <laughs> and Felix has a great sense of humor. Obviously, Mo meant nothing by it. It was just a very funny because in the control room, as you can guess, sometimes we make. We make jokes. Sometimes they're appropriate. Sometimes they're not. You know, they're never like vulgar or anything. But we we will make fun of players if they do stupid things. We will show each other replays of really bad shots that maybe don't make it to the broadcast. Mm. Um, Ben Calloway one uh, from Emporia Country Club uh, comes to mind a few years ago where Ben went to like kind of. It was like a, a 50 foot jump approach and it went straight right. Like it caught caught on his fingers. I think we did show that. Actually. We didn't show it live, but I think uh, they, they they brought it back uh, for like a, a a social post. But it was not showed live because even Mo was like, "I there's no context other than it's a really bad shot." So we do that stuff in the control room, as you can guess, and we try to make each other laugh with really stupid nicknames. Um, and, and sometimes they make it to the broadcast. Obviously, the the magician of Manaqua was one Mo came up with a few years ago, and I <sighs> and I heard it a few times this weekend. Not just from I, from Mo, but I heard it from Terry on the broadcast. I heard it from Doss, Nate, I think. Doss on the broadcast. Um, the Kansas City Kid for Allie Smith. Mm-hmm. That was one that I came up with. Uh, Marky comes up with some really good ones. Not always appropriate. Um, but that's kind of our thing. If someone doesn't have a nickname, we try to come up with something. Sometimes we're purposefully stupid. And um, and so that's what we do in the control room. And it's, it's, it's just a, a yuck fest in here, Terry. A yuck fest. Maybe you should just get a... Satellite truck and fix the uh, fix the you fix, <laughs> fix the yuck the, fest. <laughs> the, the problems. So. Uh, Alfred had asked on the board. Also, just so you know, the after show is a great place to ask us questions directly on the YouTube chat. That's a good place to do it. 
if we see it and read it and it's semi-appropriate or we're mildly smart enough to answer it we'll try to do so there alfred did ask what happened with the masters tour how'd that go they all got old uh every everybody hurts uh here we are the tour finale for the disc golf masters tour is happening this weekend in marion north carolina as many would you would already know it as north cove where we saw the silver event early in the year earlier uh it's happening october 19th through the 22nd so it looks like thursday through saturday uh i'm sorry thursday through sunday i do not know any more of the details uh you can check out the tour points standings here oh looks like i can i can provide a click or a link for you at least um, there, there is a pdga event for it the tournament director obviously kelly mcmoran yep um and what at, does it show for uh currently registered players i don't 102 know. registered players okay uh 20 mp40s uh four fp40s 21 mp50s um it looks like from i wouldn't say all over the country but it looks like mississippi and yeah huge representation yeah a, 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 i mean there's one somebody robert ryan from california who actually i think drives a truck so he's yeah. le- yes, he, he's correct. all over the country anyway but it looks like a lot from the mississippi in um it is is what this event is drawing a little but, more eastern yeah but eastern yeah US. it's uh not bad honestly not bad turnout for having like a a a masters only event you know i'm looking at the mp the mp40 you got north carolina maine michigan minnesota louisiana uh, arkansas so tennessee oh there is an oregon there yeah so, brandon yep alabama so a good mix of wisconsin tim tim murphy good luck out there overall pretty cool i would say yeah so that's what's happening uh unfortunately that's the extent of what i know at the moment ace run are you still out there i'm gonna guess maybe you're involved with filming it this weekend that seems like something Sounds that like you right guys there, would Allie. be uh here our heroes for possibly uh you covering um so that's what's taking place i'm sure at some point we'll get a catch up from callie it was great to hear her early on in the beginning of the year and talk about the masters tour forming i you know clearly she's been keeping uh, copious amounts of notes as to mm-hmm. things that have gone well some of the challenges some of the triumphs i'm sure it's been a little bit of everything but just the massive undertaking that it is uh big shout out to her and and seeing it through Shit. all the way to this weekend's should we go play? No, no, God, mm. no. Um, you didn't qualify. Should, should no? Should Smashbox start a Grandmasters tour? Mm. <laughs> we'll let Callie have the Masters. We'll take the Grandmasters. Ooh, ooh, uh, that's a way to bump up the numbers. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is your that is your. <laughs> though, though, that seems to be the demographic uh, that, that enjoys your, my commentary the most. Yeah, that is, is that you know, what you're saying. It, yeah, it was really funny. We were walking through USDGC, Terry and I, and in like a period of like ten minutes, I think there there were like three particularly um, gentlemen of that age, probably fifty to sixty plus. That walked over, said hi to us, you know, looked at Terry, said, Oh, I love your commentary, Terry. I love the videos. I've been watching them forever. And it was just funny that it happened so quickly where I I chuckled. I'm like, Yeah, there's your uh there's your demographic, Terry. Men sixty and older. So but you know what? If you're impressing the legends of our sport, which all of them were <laughs> What can uh, I say? You, you you can't argue. You can't argue with that. I think yeah, I think one of them was like Dave Greenwell. We saw George from the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Alan Beaver was one of them who showed up. So you can't argue with the quality of the play. Find me better better There's humans none. than them. There are none. If I have their approval, what do I say? <laughs> I I You've value the else. I value the opinions of those whom I respect, and yes. uh, I respect all of those gentlemen greatly. So I'll as, take it. As do I. Nah, you're, you're not. You're not what you're saying right now. No, I do. I'm just saying uh, it's your demo. <laughs> You're not you're not attracting twelve year old kids with your commentary. You, I, you know, as, as uh, those, those are the as hilarious kids. as I am, I know as as modern as your references are with <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly the, the Fortnite references you make and uh-huh, such. Uh huh. Nailed it. Uh, what happened to Alex Russell? We're just we're not seeing him play as much. Uh, certainly not on the tour. I'm not sure if um, what to be said about that. Uh, as I quickly look at his PDGA, I, still rated a thousand three. Was he at USDGC? No, um, okay. it looks like I, I know he toured around a little bit. He cashed in every event this year except for Worlds. Uh, he was in Wisconsin for a little bit, oh. 
Uh, he's played almost all A tiers this year, uh, including uh, places like Michigan. A couple of A tiers in Michigan. He played Worlds. He played in the Lake Superior Open, which I'm going to assume was in northern Wisconsin or or uh, over in Minnesota. Uh, one of the two, probably. Oh no, Superior, Wisconsin, nearly Minnesota. And uh, that's about it. I I don't know. Uh, exactly what his game plan is maybe like he's he, yeah he's <laughs> playing this weekend at the gatekeeper media presents Downey's players cup so he's playing in that and then in december he's playing the battle at bennett park so if you're uh, trying to find him that those are a couple places you can do it good place to start but yeah we're not seeing him he's definitely not on the pro tour grinding it out week in and week out got this year his tour card which probably made things a little more difficult and um so, uh, Eric on the board says, I ran into Kevin Kiefer last week. He seems to be making great progress on his rehab and recovery from his injury, injury slash surgery now. Yeah. yeah best of luck leg. to him. And, uh, you, you're right. You can find him on Instagram. I see him making posts, uh, trying to just rehab and, and get all healed up. So hopefully, uh, he's on a quick mend. Um, I just see he, I see he just not made lead cards. Yeah, I mean he he hasn't been playing actually in a lot of the events. Most of the events that you're your high end live covered events, you're not seeing him. He played in a ton of A tiers and one B tier and then Worlds and Worlds being the only one he didn't cash. So that's uh that's what that's the update on Alex. Hopefully all is well with him. It was Worlds. It was Worlds I saw him off in a distance um and i didn't get a chance to necessarily catch up with him but i know i was gonna say i know i saw him somewhere but it was at worlds briefly um yeah as i just alluded to earlier way earlier hours ago in the show i'm excited i'll be at the plo in a couple weeks the phoenix ladies open is taking place that's out in the second week in november i know they have a little over 100 women signed up it's an all women's event crazy payouts, big player pack, all that good stuff. Uh, there will be some coverage of it. So I'm working on that and it will be the 17th annual. And uh, I know Dan and Robin just hosted a poker party this weekend out in Arizona to, to do more fundraising for that event. So looking forward to it. So I'll be out there. And uh, also um, the Chainhawk Open is another event I'm planning on filming in a few weeks as well. So, well, I guess that's the uh, first week of December. But a lot of people talk about the season ending. I guess that's where I'm coming with the season ending. Now it largely for myself personally rolls into a lot of that uh, post-production. I see gatekeepers got something going on this weekend. I know Ace Run is going to be grinding out throughout the offseason uh, on a number of other events. And maybe it just becomes kind of an A-tier post-production time frame right now for a lot of us. And maybe for the first year or the first time in a long time, you don't have a ton of backed up footage i really don't because yeah, there wasn't he, yeah a lot of the things i was busy with the pro tour yeah a lot of things that worked on i we didn't cover a lot of other things outside of pro tour events some things that do come to mind include uh a presentation which i know a ton of you aren't going to necessarily flock to immediately but a presentation from pro masters worlds where we had a little history of disc golf, actually a lot of history of disc golf. And then another one that'll be a slightly separate video from that that I'll release for sure is a PDGA disc going under the approval process in real time. So a company had submitted some discs. Jeff Homburg, who also gave a presentation, went through and literally had the tools, the numbers, the spec sheets, everything else to attempt to approve a disc right there in front of a, a live audience, so to speak. And I, rec excuse me, I recorded it. So that's, I, I understand that's going to hit the mark for some and plenty of others will scroll right on past it. But it's, it's kind of cool to see exactly what goes into a, um, an approval of a disc. And Jeff is the guy that does that. So, uh, Clearly, you, you said it earlier that we're seeing some of these outside sponsors and somebody that's come back and is supported not only our, our playoffs, but then the tour championship specifically is Barbasol. Which I'm disappointed. I think I only once heard the put it on your face and it was kind of mediocre. I limited it this year. The time I heard it, and maybe you said it more than once, but the one time I heard it, 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 it felt a little bit forced. Um, I, I would have liked to. I would have liked to have heard a "put it on your face" 
Maybe one or two more times. Yeah, uh, I, it was in limited uh, use this weekend. As much as I still do love it and wish, I wish the uh, the one time where it just kind of pops up and I, and I recorded it last year and it says Barbasol, Close Shave America, Close Shave Barbasol or whatever it is. Yeah. I wish the it was bumper. just that one was just Barbasol. Put it on your face. I, I wish there was an alternative to that one. I wish but. you could have done like Barbasol. Close Shave America, Close Shave Barbasol. Put it on your face. Just real, like like actual professional like, with like it. Actually, yeah. professionally do it. Yeah, and, that, and see and see if Mo would have let it go. <laughs> Again, that yeah. was the same bumper that we used last year, so uh, it got it yeah. got recycled. Yeah, but, Dust says that's a great slogan. Put it on your face. Ah, uh, I mean, their argument clearly could be that there's you know there shaving other yeah other things. Yeah, sure. I get it. Put it on your disc and your face. <laughs> Say disc, <laughs> disc. Yeah, make put sure it on your disc. Very clear. On that. your disc. Yeah. Disc. Put it on your labrum. <laughs> disc. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and, the, and as Eric quickly makes the comment of your your joke about Gannon Burr, <laughs> you threw that in there that you've seen grown men grow or men grow beards in the time <laughs> it's taken him Gannon to Burr throw. To throw. I, I said this. Somebody else. He was uh, a, he was a little pokey at times. Uh, he can't can't deny it. For one, I want to prove to the world I don't pick on Nico. Well, you like, do, but you pick well, on other people. That yeah, I, I'm an equal opportunity caller outer. I I have no ill will against Nico LaCastro, and I think some people really think, oh, like Terry just hates that guy. I don't at all. Uh, I I just want him to play within his thirty seconds. I love Gannon Burr. I just want him to play within his thirty seconds. Uh, I like Jacob Curtis. I just want him to play within his 30 seconds. Like if there's anyone that's slower, you ever hear me making any kind of snide remark uh, or getting a little punchy over it. It's not because I dislike the person. I just want them, whoever it is to throw within their 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> and, and for the most part, the fun, the, the real funny thing about me saying that is everyone agrees like, oh, yeah, but, but the people that get a little more defensive are super big, maybe hardcore Gannon Burr fans. And you you don't you don't need to get you don't need to send any canceling hate mail my way or to the network. Um, I, I sent at least two. <laughs> yeah, well, for different reasons. Yeah, I, like, oh, I just hate this announcer guy, <laughs> <laughs> dear Terry. Uh, I am directing the show. Well, I should be right now, but I can't not email you. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, uh, I get it. Um, it is what it is. Now, what would be great is obviously Alden and his the the, the, the vlogs that they do. Mm -hmm. If they cut to Gannon going into the woods, and they cut out to Gannon coming out with a beard, <laughs> like some sort of yeah, you know, there you go, Terry Miller. Uh, I'll might, show you. That'd be more ten more years for him, though. I mean, Unless he's a guy it's... who doesn't really need Barbasol. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> um. You know, and and here's the other part of it. Gannon is obviously aware. We've talked about it on yeah. the show. He's talked about it on the he's even he's discussed it on camera about his timing. He is well aware of what's going on there. And I I, I think that all kind of feeds into it being so much more acceptable. If it was some kind of like some deep dark secret that only a couple of us knew about and then somehow is like drumming up drudging up some some crazy secretive I don't know, side story or backstory or something in the past or something that's unbecoming in, in like a serious capacity, I think it would be different. But mm. I take a jab from here and there. You're right. No uh, have no you been asked to do Alden's vlog before? I figured they may ask you this week. Uh, they, I was, I was partially involved with Alden's vlog last, uh, at the beginning of this year when we covered the memorial. And Alden had to drive <laughs> drive Cannon over to my to my uh, hotel and able to to be able to do the commentary of which he killed it. And he was really good at it and enjoyed it. But uh, he was driven over, and then Alden and them ended up shooting a few things in, within my hotel, and uh, all as part of the you know the experience of being at the memorial. That's the extent in which I've been involved in any of of Alden's vlogs. So I don't know if I'll get asked back in any capacity or not. I think that's. I don't believe there's a lot of planning in that. I think that's more. I'm gonna film film a bunch of stuff. Maybe they have a funny skit they have planned or something. Yeah. But 
and then uh, Alden at some point during the week puts it together, or they come up with something on the fly. Like, yeah, it's where you are at that point, correct. whether that which happens you, or not. Which is what I love. I think it's it's very sure. natural. Those guys are phenomenal at that, and it it every I watch again. They're the only disc golf channel I'm subscribed to on my personal besides mine. YouTube. No, I'm not even. Uh, Eric <laughs> says, in your defense, Terry, I actually clocked him at over 55 seconds on two holes that were prior to you making the comment. It was justified. Uh, I mean, to be fair, and this could be said of a lot of our players that exceed time. There's a lot of time you don't even see. Like the control room knows the oh. tendencies of players. So the control room themselves, when possible and applicable, they'll trim out if so, somebody might like Gannon Miss, might be standing over a putt for 55 seconds or Gannon Burr and Missy Gannon. Okay. Sometimes if they're going, you know, they know, and it's going to be shown in replay. They, at that point can potentially, it's all about resources and timing, but they could potentially trim that 55 second interaction down to the 15 seconds. So you're not actually even seeing a ton Eagle of it, just like I do in post-production. Yeah, not that these people go over their 30 seconds, but we know their routines. Chris Dickerson. Yeah, or just a little longer. Just, just are longer that we can squeeze in a shot. Like, if we know they're walking up to, as one person walks off the tee box, if it's like an Eagle or a Missy, or there's a few other players that we already know. James Conrad. James Conrad, exactly. Like, like oh, we know we can squeeze a shot in here and not have to really worry about the player getting up and throwing. Correct. You cannot do that with Isaac Robinson. You no, You cannot of do it with Kevin Jones. Like there, We know players where it's like you literally are struggling sometimes to get to them to get their shots, but we do know some players that we just like they take yeah. 25 seconds, and, mm -hmm. and that's fine. We have no complaints. Sometimes it's great for us. Yeah. We know we can squeeze shots in. Alfred asks, any new skip base features, uh, adjustments, et cetera, for next season? Yes. Um, new developer, um, the gentleman who, so real quick history, I developed the site way back when in Macromedia Dreamweaver. So I'm going to date mm. myself um, mid-2000s. Um, that's when I first, no, I'm sorry, late 2000s, I believe, is kind of when I first started really pushing it out, mid to late 2000s. And... At some point, I wanted to do things that I didn't know how to do, so I, I brought on a gentleman named Joel, who was a con who lives here in Milwaukee, um, and he helped me kind of upgrade the site to the more modern version of what it is, from <laughs> from the old just pure PHP and HTML to more of a uh, a framework system. And then at some point, he was like, "Hey, I don't have time to do this. I have other clients who are who pay way more than you do." <laughs> And I was like, okay, I get that. And he pushed me to another developer who lived out in uh, Salt Lake City. And then, strangely enough, the guy who lived in Salt Lake City actually moved to Milwaukee here. And I, I had... Which uh, is attracting all the people. Exactly. Uh, and so I had lunch with him a couple months ago. Now, he is actually this, this other developer that I had been working with. He took a full-time position with another company. Where he's gonna, he gets to develop a, a team and whatnot. And so I was looking for a new developer. I sent an email out, and the Joel gentleman who helped me do it says, "Like I, I'm actually now part of a two man crew, so I have got more time if you would like to work with me again." And I thought that was great. So I'll be working with Joel again. And as far as new features, the big one that I'm really, really excited for that we're gonna start developing uh, November first is live scoring. So I will be able to actually update scores on the fly. So you'll be able to log in at any point and see your score. And normally it works where you have to wait. We wait overnight, all the scores process and run. And then they, and then it goes from there. Like then you look at the next day like, oh, cool, I'm standing here. That's fine. It works. But we'll be able to do live scoring now. So and that is because we will have some access to more granular data. Not all the data I'd love to have. I'd love to get into the UDISC data and get like C1, C2, scramble, all those fun things. But it, that just has not worked out for five years or so. They are ve they're a very busy crew. But I do have access to the scoring data, so raw scores. So there'll be a new, for a new scoring format that will rely on birdies, bogeys, um, anything you can kind of try to do with actual scoring. Maybe 
um, stacking is what I'm calling it, where you'll be able to have, uh, you know, multiple birdies in a row will get you more points. Like, oh, he scored three birdies in a row. That's a bonus point or whatever it is. Or two bogeys in a row is a negative bonus point, whatever you want to do. Um, things like that. Maybe one of the features, and I don't know for sure if this is going to make it or not, but like a hard hole bonus. So you look at all the UDISC stats in which are just, you know, who has done birdie or better? Is it less than 10%? Then maybe if your player got it, you get a bonus. Um, maybe you get a penalty for easy. If your player misses an easy birdie, did more than 50% of the field birdie it or better? Your player didn't? Uh, maybe you're going to get lose points for that. So things that you can extract from scoring data will be in it. Again, I, we don't, I still don't have access, and I don't know if I ever will, to be honest. The C1, C2, Scramble, I don't know if I'll ever have access to that stuff, but the actual scoring data we will, so there's going to be uh, more points related to that. That's the really big thing this offseason that we're going to be working on. That's a whole new format, scoring format, and the live scoring will be um, the real focus of what we're doing. I have a new format in mind that I'm not going to make public yet, and I don't know if I'm going to, because I, I don't know if we're going to get to it this off season. It all depends on how much we can get done in like the two to three months that we have before the season starts. But the new format I have is it, it could be really fun. And, uh, and, and I'm really hoping to, to implement it maybe next year. I, we'll see how it goes. Could be like a middle of the year kind of thing where a new format is, is pushed out because it's not really dependent on events more player driven. So we'll maybe we'll talk about that in a, in a future uh, version. But other than that, that's like, that's like the big one that we're working on live scoring and that there's a couple little features that we're obviously going to be pushing out there. Um, I really want to have uh, a little bit better draft board, um, some more data for the players, for our premium members. So with like things like average draft pick and maybe point score, you know, what's your average point scoring every week? for each individual player. You know, I think we already have average finish position, things like that. I want to make that better. Um, I've got more ideas, but obviously the more ideas I have, the more money I have to pay to make mm. that happen. Uh. So it's, it's going to be different, but I'm really excited for finally having live scoring, which means I'm also, if you know anybody that would like to do, that would like to pay a bunch of money to me uh, to be the sponsor of the live scoring page, I'm here for it. And I'm guessing I got 50 bucks. That's not going to be enough, Terry. I mean, it's I'm, 50 more than you're getting. It is right now. And maybe I'll come to you for that 50 bucks. If not, nobody else shows <laughs> no up. No other better offer shows up. <laughs> if no other better offer Shit, shows up. Did I say 50? I meant 25. Yeah. And, and I'm, I mean, I'm not shy about sharing some of this stuff. I think the site had about 1.5 million views. That's, that's not impressions. An impression is an ad. So like you disc, they rotate their ads every 10 or 15 seconds, I think. And so each one of those ads is an impression, um, which is different than a view. A view is like basically a page when it loads. So we had about 1.5 million page loads this season. And, and so, yeah, so that's like some of the advertising information that hopefully I'll be able to put. And I don't know what the live scoring will bring. Maybe it'll bring more. I mean, if we get people sitting on that page because they want to, kind of keep an eye on their scores that could be way bigger. So I'm hoping to maybe pull in some, pull in some sponsor for that. I think that would be kind of cool. But if you, if you're interested and you're listening out there, if you're one of the major manufacturers or Barbasol, put it on your face, put it on my website. I can do that too. We'll see. Uh, my only, I think my only main follow up to the, some of the new features would be if I show up three minutes before my tea time at an eight tier. Yeah. Can you, can there be a stat for like penalty strokes for missed for the two stroke penalty? Is, you, you're, you, is it on the PDGA page? Like does, d does the PDGA keep track I mean, I'll, of it? I'll get the penalty strokes. Yeah. But I don't know how that would be assessed. Would that be assessed? You on... get, is, I think it said you get two penalty strokes, which is kind of crazy because obviously if you miss a hole, you get par plus four. But I think they explicitly said earlier when I was perusing that uh, it's just a two-stroke penalty. Assuming you play the hole, it would be a two-stroke penalty. Correct. So if then, so if you didn't show up and you missed the first hole, is that a two-stroke penalty plus the par plus four? 
It's a good question. You would, I would think not, but I, that, that is worth then, a follow up. Yeah, Cause like, if you don't show up for whole one, let's say you, you you're in a traffic jam. Yep. Crap. I can't get there. I'm going to be late. I'm not going to be able to show up until the players are down the fairway on hole one. Mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't. So you have to join with them on hole on hole two. On hole two. I didn't check in five minutes prior. So there's mm-hmm. two strokes. I miss hole one par plus four. Now I'm technically hole one is you're the most six be- over your six over par and it's a par five. So you've just taken an 11. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that that's a that, great follow up yeah. Mid- and it might even actually be on y- y- you know the, the page that I didn't look tomorrow. But. I'll have a message from MTL. He'll let me know. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, um, all right. A couple other quick uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, Sean and Sheila Callahan celebrated their 14 year anniversary. Technically now yesterday, I want to get it in there. Uh, just the great crew down there in uh, Illinois. And, you know, we've seen some awesome events down there and they do a lot of good stuff along with the pro shop. They had a 14 year anniversary yesterday. I, I thought I wanted to get that in there for a shout out. Ray, also, Ray asked if we did, we see the eclipse over the weekend. I did not. I did not. It was very cloudy here in Milwaukee. So it was kind of tough to see it. Um, there were one or two pictures I saw from the Milwaukee area where people kind of caught a little bit between the clouds, but it, it was not it was not very prevalent here. Um, another thing I want to quickly mention is uh, we saw earlier, if you look on UDISC, there is an event going on this weekend for the Euro Tour. Euro Tour, and uh, I clicked on something else for the standings to see that if you go to MBO for the Euro Tour. Paul Macbeth is winning that. And I don't know how many events are left, but I don't know if he has a chance to, to actually get past or not. Uh, Yakub Samarad is in second with 375 points. Nicholas Antelas in third with 338. I see Silver, who I, uh, we know, is with 294. Uh, Miro is in fourth. But anyway, Scott Stokely's up there in sixth. Anyway, uh, so it's kind of funny that... I don't think Paul's showing up to the finale. I, I don't know if he is. If that is the finale, somebody I'm sure from I'm, the PDG Euro I'm Tour could let us know. fairly certain... This weekend is this, the finale? Uh, no, I'm thinking the EPT. I'm thinking the European Pro Tour. I, I certainly different. cannot keep them all straight. I'm not sure. But nonetheless, uh, I thought that was kind of funny that he is currently y- y- leading the Euro Tour. Which I'm sure has probably been made, was news made otherwise uh, somewhere else. But uh, I, yeah, I feel like this weekend's the last. Uh, as far as I can see, it looks like this weekend would be the last weekend. The question is how many points are on the line and who has signed up for it? Mm. Um, or if this is just the, uh, the finals. Yeah, all this talk about player of the year and Calvin versus, you know, Gannon versus Isaac. No one's talking about Paul's dominance of the Euro Tour. Yeah, exactly. That just gets thrown out the door because Paul, because because it's not your American Disc Golf Pro Tour. Gosh. So Euro, so so USA centric. I tell you guys, <laughs> and the tea times. Uh, I don't know. I didn't want to click on that and find out what time those are at. So I'm not going to make it. Anyway, uh, is it Andalus Lucia Andalusa is taking place? The Anda. Andalusia Open is taking place in Spain this weekend. So I wish I was there. That'd be fun. That would be a lot of fun. Let's go. I see Silver is playing. Uh, I don't see. Let's just go. Niklas. Let's fly out tomorrow. Uh, Yakub is there. So maybe, I don't know, maybe he can earn enough points to uh, overtake Paul for the season. We'll see. I got the Smashbox credit card. We'll go. That's a good idea. I, I could get down with that. Uh, oh, Ryan Pilcher's chiming in on the board saying you you wouldn't get extra strokes for that. You'd only get the par plus four. That's How do a, you know? That may or may not have been asked somewhere else. Maybe. Okay, so only the championship is left, uh, the finale. That's, that's probably what this technically is this weekend. So the question is, can more points be earned, and is it a higher? So if Yakub were to win... And let is it worth 125 or 150 points, or is the point scoring already been established, and therefore Paul is officially the winner? That's kind of the question. All right, I think we could get ready for some uh, some, some giveaways. Some giveaway stuff. At least one. Now there's a long. Uh, now there's a conversation about what kale, eggplant, onions. I hate onions. Just don't like them. Not gonna like any onion. Not re- like if it's mixed in on a 
Philly cheesesteak with some green peppers and red peppers and jalapenos and black olives. Uh, other, it's tolerable. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, pretty much a pass for me. They just stink. Not not in a salad. No, definitely not in a salad. Def- like raw onion. Yeah, yeah raw thing. onion is the worst onion. If it's cooked into something, it's usually tolerable. I'll still prefer to not have it. However, raw onion is loud and disgusting. Loud? And smelly. <laughs> yeah, smelly loud. Smelly loud. I've smelly never heard, loud. Never heard smelly. I'm gonna loud say before, loud and I'll, smelly. I'll, I'll give you that. Um, I don't mind like onions in my salad. Gross. Like, like like the round red onions that they that they cut. They're sliced. It's not bad. I don't like cooked onions at all. Mm. I don't. I don't want them on really anything. And if they're on something, I'll throw it back at the person. <laughs> no, no. I just I, I I don't tolerate that. The only thing I really <laughs> tolerate that i don't tolerate that Terry. no you don't um, the only thing i can kind of stand onions in is is a salad because i'm d- probably dumping some sort of sauce on it Gross. ranch or uh parmesan peppercorn still or, no none like, of those. I, I, I don't i don't mind as much but even then just a little light onion it's not enough I cover I up i don't want it i don't want a heavy onion so Patreon.com slash Smashbox TV, where you can get all of our onion takes. Mm-hmm. We've got our own separate onion uh, podcast. Mm-hmm. So you can uh, you can tune in to our onion podcast every late Tuesday night. Late Tuesday. Uh, it's every late Tuesday night. Um, and for those of you that are wondering, Patreon now offers a free tier, which you can subscribe to our channel. We haven't. They just started it last week. Um, we're not really doing anything with the free tier yet. Not yet. Um, and we I, might not. And we might never. Um, if you want to be eligible for our weekly giveaway, you have to be in the paid tier. So that's the, at least just $1 a, dollar. a month. <laughs> just a dollar a month, and you can be eligible for our weekly giveaway. You can also be eligible for our weekly giveaway if you go to smashbox.tv slash weekly giveaways. And every week you need to register for that. Like this week, there's a few people that registered. It was, as they always, Glenn Reiser. Glenn. Pleasure, pleasure to meet you, Glenn. Um, Yarno, Robert, and Christopher. So we got- Appreciate uh, you guys. Those four people who, and there's there's two or three of them that do it every single week. I don't know if they set up some sort of script or a reminder, but as long as you go in and you register every week, your name will be added to this list. And you'll be included in the dollar and above patrons. But if you don't want to think about it and you just want to be eligible, it only costs you a dollar a week, although we, or a dollar a month at, at, the, at the least. We prefer a dollar a week. And even more so, we love you if you do $5 a week. I'm just saying. Um, that's, that's it. So, patreon.com slash smashbox TV. Terry. We have 132 people that are eligible for our giveaway this week. Ooh, how do you want to do this? Ricky won $40,000. So 40,000 <laughs> iterations running through the script. But it was his third time, I think, claiming the Disc Golf Pro Tour Championship. So with that, we draw three numbers. Three numbers. Our first number is 31. Our second number is 132. So the highest it could have been. I'm going to go it's lower than 132. Oh, you're so bold. Just, just making a you bold You are prediction. such a bold statistician. Holy cow. The B132. B132 number is 69. 69. Dudes. 69. 69. Uh as you take a look, 69 is Joseph Thomas. Congratulations Joseph Thomas. I sorted it by email address by the uh, way. Ah, yes. So that Clearly. his email starts with a K for some reason. But Joseph <laughs> Thomas, you won. He is a $3 patron and has been oh. for quite a while. So well, thank we you very much, you, Joseph. Joseph. Thank um, you. I will send your information to Terry Miller. And we will. Do, speaking of which, we need to get on the uh, the yearly discs. Yes. So we got to start talking to some of our manufacturing friends about getting our discs for our $3 and above patrons. If you have been a $3 and above patron, you will be eligible for the disc that we give away every single year. We send it out to all of the $3 and above patrons so that you can get the yearly Smashbox Yeah, disc. so there's a good chance you, yeah. we're losing money on you depending on yeah. how much you're providing us, and we're okay with that. We're okay with that. By the time we get a disc and then ship it to you, yeah, 
And maybe you only give us a dollar a month. No, then they don't get it. They have to give them oh, three dollars. Three dollars a month. Three dollars a month. So even so, oh. that's so at most. Mm, yeah, you, know, you okay, get you okay, give okay. us thirty six bucks a year. You know, we, it depends on where we're shipping it. We're I mean we're still making a few bucks, but uh, but we're just happy that you're a Patreon supporter and you also get access to the podcast early. You'll get it tonight, right after I render it out. You're the first per- people I upload it to. So if for some reason you are a uh, maybe maybe you work at night and you can't listen, but suddenly your podcast catcher says, "Bing, hey look." Smashbox is there. Time to I download the, that. I can I go to sleep to those a holes. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Wade, all good. Uh, hope you're doing well. You said that you're taking some medication that doesn't that you said um, doesn't makes you do some out of the ordinary things. Well, I hope you're doing well. I, I will send in a formal apology, and I'll say it here. Oh, formal apology. Uh, a semi-formal. I mean, it'll, it'll get sent via you know Instagram DMs. A gentleman reached out to me this weekend and was frustrated that the stream had cut out during the FPO. Was frustrated with it. It was a Vimeo um, issue. Uh, which was, of course, as yeah, was a Vimeo issue. Nonetheless, I can understand it being frustrating. Certainly. Uh, I maybe got a little frustrated with some of the tone in which he essentially said, hey, is it going to be broke this afternoon? And you guys aren't even trying to fix this. Of course, we're trying to fix it. However, uh, in, in sending something back that had a little bit of a cocky tone to it, because I felt I was I was addressed that way, um, then we had a back and forth, and uh, he essentially feels like the broadcast is my job. And it is. I, I talk on the broadcast, but it is not exclusively my job you're, you're, to fix a Vimeo issue, the technical issues, a, a technical issue of this scale and magnitude, no matter what I do, no matter who I scream to, no matter how much I beg and plead or how much money I hand over, I do not have enough money to fix said technical issue. My, my analogy that I then came up with yesterday is originally I said, that's like, and I don't claim to be him, but that's like Troy Aikman, like you complaining to Troy Aikman while he's doing the broadcast at an NFL game about the wrong graphics on the jumbotron. Like that's not Troy. Like that's not him, right? Like there's a million other people that would be able to fix that or address that before Troy Aikman. I was thinking of that from a broadcast perspective, but I think a more similar, but yet more appropriate analogy would be that's like showing up to the gate agent who's checking your bag at the airline and saying, Hey, is this effing plane going to go up in time today? Or is it going to be broken? Like all of your other planes, and then yelling and getting frustrated with the the woman who or man who's checking my bags. Like, I understand your frustration. That bag ticket taker is not is not the appropriate channel. And yes, it is their job to fly people, but again, he or she has nothing to do with the actual physical functioning of a plane. And as we've said for the last few weeks, it's already well known that Disc Golf Pro Tour is Probably not going to be on Vimeo next year. There has already been talks of Jeff. Jeff made this announcement, I think, to some of the players. He talked about it on another podcast. There will be a different provider. Now, again, as I've said, keep, let's keep the expectations low. It'll be a new service. There will be hiccups along the way. But ultimately, this will probably be better in the long run. But the short run, there might be some glitches. So. Just not maybe, the MVP disc either. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe Disc Golf Pro Tour will give out glitches. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, but just be prepared. Uh, I, I think that there will be some in the next. I would guess in the next month and a half to two months, we'll you'll probably hear something. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know when they're going to announce it. I know a little bit behind the scenes stuff, so I'm fairly certain of it. I wouldn't hold Johnny to anything. But don't hold me to anything. <laughs> uh, um, good night, uh, Alfred. Good to see you. Uh, and no, WT Force Wade, that was not you that was ending. It was another gentleman, and I have since then thought about it. We had a heated exchange uh, where he was getting really frustrated with me as if I didn't care. I do care. But again, you're getting wrong at the at the, at the wrong guy. Uh, when the stream had broken yeah, down. I, I would tell somebody if it was like a control room problem, like, oh man, someone's computer crashed at the control room and it wrecked a bunch of stuff. 
flat out that it, it this was, which has happened in the past, sure. not this year, in previous years where or power went out or something. Um, this was flat out just a Vimeo issue. There was a glitch at Vimeo side. There was nothing we could do about it. Um, and, and that's just nonetheless. It. And some but people it, may a, not care about that. It's frustrating, and, and, I and it is frustrating. And I. I You're do. paying for a service. But just know, screaming at me, uh, and I'm not trying to pass the buck, but screaming at me uh, is not going to get us uh, anyone too far. Um, yeah. What did, uh, I'm sorry, I saw a very legitimate question asked about, um, Terry has Terry only has to travel almost 1,000 miles to Ben to do live. Do you think it would be reasonable for Terry or Charlie to remotely do their commentary. Yeah, and Charlie has Charlie doesn't travel to Ben generally, but uh, he has would once it, or twice. Would it be reasonable? Sure. Would it be as good of a quality? No. Um, part of the thing that... Uh, there's a system behind the scenes called Sienna, and one of the things that I know the control room is going to work on in the off-season is hopefully working out some of the um, commentator solutions. So it's a technical issue, which is why we see the second and a half, second to second and a half delay on some of the calls. It's just, it's again, it's physics. <laughs> you know, the signal has to go from one place all the way over to Bend and then come back to Amazon in the cloud and then we send it out. But it's 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 a thing, which is why there's a little delay on their commentary. Um, with the Sienna tool, it might cut that delay down. If we're lucky, maybe we can get it to about a half a second or a, a, a few frames, so to speak, where it would not feel as obvious. Um, that is the hope. There is some testing that has to be done yet. There are options. I know there's a, a very complicated way that Gary found where he can really mess with the, the commentators as long as they're off the screen. And if we go back to the booth, as we do maybe once a show, to just check in with the booth, there has to be a whole undo button where we just undo like the delay so that their mouth isn't two seconds off or a second and a half off from their face and then turn it back on when we go back to action. So it, it's much more complicated. I'm hoping that the Sienna tool, that with the testing they do, that they find out that it is a tolerable delay of only a few frames, You know, which obviously a frame is... 30th or 60th of a second, depending on, you know, what we're filming at and that maybe it would only be like at most a half a second of delay, which would be very almost unnoticeable for 99.9% .9 of the time, as opposed to now when most people don't notice, except like I would say 90% of the time or 85% of the time people don't notice the delay until, you know, you, you see someone just barely miss and then a second and a half one of the commentator goes, oh, he was so close. And mm -hmm. then we have already seen it roll out of bounds or something. Those are the most notable times. And again, thank thankfully, I guess, it's nothing Terry nor I have to work on anymore. But as far as remote commentary, if the Sienna project works, it could be better for remote commentators if they weren't in the same place. But it's still not ideal because there's so much behind the scenes that happens that you guys maybe don't see, whether it's, looks or hand signals or shoulder rubs. I don't know what they do in the commentary with. I don't get a chance to watch it, mm -hmm. but I'm just assuming that, that Terry's like, you know, giving both Nate's shoulder rubs during, during the, during like the say show. This, and then I whisper in their ear. <laughs> yeah. You say say this, say this, set me up for this <laughs> stupid dad joke. Say it, <laughs> say it. I'm so punny. I've got something. I've got something. <laughs> so uh, who knows? I mean, maybe, maybe this remote commentary thing will can, can get better and be more reasonable. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe we still have to fly people around. I don't know. Uh, I, I just want to touch on a few more things before we go here soon. Uh, JDXN11 says, I canceled my renewal because the stream always went down. Hearing there could be more glitches confirms I won't sign back up. Uh, I think don't take too much of what Johnny just said and no. like roll with it in that sense. First of all, let me just start yeah. here. The off season will have very little streaming of live stuff. So there's going to be a ton of off-season content that the network has worked really hard for you to enjoy. So I, I will say that, and, I, and I'm not trying to like regain you and as a subscriber live, necessarily. So no but yeah, so there won't be any glitches there. And second of all, uh, 
it's not so much that the stream will go down. Uh, we're not projecting or claiming that that could pot potentially happen more. We're talking about the player in which it's on may or may not have some increased functionality yeah. that may or may not be 100% ready to go um, or may have an additional challenge or two. But yeah, it's, I think it's not like we're projecting, no. hey, there were you know 39 instances of challenges and we're expecting 47 next year. Like That's not what we're trying to say. Just know that with any new product, clearly there could still be some form of potential hiccup or challenge to it. That and we're not guaranteed that. No, but there certainly it is the possibility. Be. You can buy a brand new car, right? You could trade in your 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 twenty old twenty year old perfectly driving used car, get a brand new car. That brand new car next week could still have something blow on it. Like it's possible. Mm -hmm. That that's that's what we're I guess in essence trying to get across. So. Yeah, you know, basically, I'm saying is set your expectations at the right level. You're moving from one system to a new system. Not every feature might be there. As far as like hiccups and stuff i'm very confident that there will be uh that they will be fully tested thoroughly tested that they will have a good workflow down i'm thinking personally that oh the old the old system i could do a search for you know a usdgc and it would bring me this and now when i search for usdgc it brings me here and it's just different like there will be a learning curve there could be things that get rolled out not immediately but as far as like reliability I'm pretty confident in the reliability of what of what they're moving yeah. to. Yeah, and this kind of goes back to one of my points earlier. Clearly, the network and the staff and the pro tour and the investors and everyone else is yeah. always trying to improve. No one is yeah. is Should see <laughs> knowingly they're, they're saying, spending. "Man, this might work way worse, but let's roll the dice and see if it actually works worse for us." Because that's what we're expecting. Of course, no one's saying that. We're looking for constant improvements. Now, if they'll be large scale or small scale, I can't make. I don't make any of those decisions or promises. However, just know that the intent is always to grow and improve. And I know they and really. If you think otherwise that's just crazy in the off season i think i heard they really want to upgrade like all the cameras on the, the on course cameras because just as you can imagine all the travel the, these guys are really good with the equipment but just i mean the sheer wear and tear they, they sheer wear and tear they take abuse and if you you probably have to replace a camera like this every two to three years i would think and these some of these cameras are getting some of these cameras might be you know four or five years old so I know they're hoping to be able to replace a bunch of the cameras with with different equipment. All but again, we're making none of said promises. Oh God, no! I, and, and again, it, I don't even know if it was to be clear. Oh God, uh, it, it you probably wouldn't even notice from your perspective based on um, yeah, the, the image quality but, because yeah, image because it's still all going through a cellular signal. So that is. But I I do know that they're looking at hopefully. Um, new cameras and i'm just saying that from a money perspective like terry says like they're they're always looking at improving they're always spending money on the broadcast to make it better so it's there's a lot there's a lot they want to do and i talked to gary and he's like yeah i'd love to have this and this for the commentators and but that's going to cost money and they want to do this and that and it's just uh there's only so much you can do in a in an off season just like the players need a little bit of break the the, the booth as well only has just a few months to roll out a bunch of new stuff and you have to test it and all this other stuff. So it's crazy. Like the off season is really just the off season for the players. <laughs> There's a lot of people that aren't getting that. Uh, Brad writes, uh, are we going to have our grudge match at Dela next spring, Terry? Probably not. If I mean, if I'm in a position to play Dela and you're around and you're not insanely obnoxious, yeah, then maybe we could play. But I'm not like making a special trip or plan uh, to get over there. Um, right. There's something else that uh, says, Wade DGPT is totally incompetent. Everyone knows paywalls do nothing but hinder revenue. Uh, so, did somebody write that? Yeah, that's what Bradley Brad Clayton wrote. Yeah, Brad. It, it, again, it shows how is that disc blaster? Uh, yeah, it shows how yeah. bright he yeah. can be. Yeah. Um, Completely not true. Uh, Wade said, I'm thinking, why don't they have the booth at the brewery? The brewery is a couple miles from their house. I'm not saying it'll never go there again, but there is something to be said about, uh, being up at four or five in the morning and getting ready as they need to. Usually it's Val 
uh, for the early East Coast things. And then walking right out into, at this point, the garage or whatever room we're using at their house. And now the fact that they also have uh, an 11 or 12 week old, uh, having it all at the house is far more conducive currently and just makes way more sense for, for them. And to me, it doesn't really matter whether I'm at, a, at the brewery or I'm in their garage, as long as they are, I don't know, well lit and <laughs> have the appropriate temperature. It doesn't really do, it would do us no good to be at the brewery, I guess is what I'm really trying to say. There's no, There's no advantage to being at the brewery. The point is, for the most part, that I'm flying to them. So rather than flying two commentators who now have a child out to somewhere else to meet with me potentially, it's, we have the luxury of, uh, or the built-in uh, established internet connection. Uh, you know, everything is pretty static at their house or, or whatever location we use, but everything's static there. Yeah, from a remote perspective, I, I said this about even the on-course booth, that if it's not literally on the course, then it feels like there's no point in having, like, there's no point in having a, a, a an on-course booth that's still remote that's, like, two miles away at an Airbnb. You know, yeah. uh, th that, that just, for the most part, doesn't make any sense. Um, just like it wouldn't matter if it was at the brewery or at Doss's house or here in my basement or wherever that may be, a remote is remote. So unless you're literally on the course, I kind of feel like as far as uh, the commentators go, it doesn't really matter where it is. Obviously, Terry would like to sleep in. He doesn't love necessarily love those early West Coast days. East Coast days, yeah, not at all. Well, uh, or West, on being Coast on the West Coast, Coast you, you're right, yeah. exactly. Uh, Eric says, I'm surprised they're not cameramen in deer stands and trees and wooded courses. I mean, we've dabbled in some of that philosophy. Yeah. The problem is that because we have so many cameramen that need to follow from hole to hole with the actual mm -hmm. play, and even then, I, I mean, take Nevin as a great example. And actually, it was at Hornet's Nest a few years ago. We put a couple guys up in some deer stand, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The big challenge is <clears throat> you're, you're playing hole. We'll just make up a hole like 16. Uh, it's only 270 feet. You hit first available, which is like 30 feet off the tee, <laughs> and you kick hard left. No one's seeing that. You know, if you're if you're if you have quote unquote static cameras that are up in trees. Now, could there be additional cameras that are up there in addition to the two or three that are already on the hole? In theory, yes, but I guess then we're going to make an argument. Would you rather have potentially four cameras on a given hole uh, along, you know, because you have two or three walking and then one or two in trees, or would you rather have two additional cameras on an entirely different card? And I'm, I'm not completely dismissing what you're saying. It's, as always, it comes down to where is your money and resources best spent to have that third or fourth or fifth camera in a, with a couple in trees or to have them on an entirely different hole following along as we stand, as we do in a normal capacity. So, um, yeah. And it's just, it always comes down to how tough it is to film in any course as we're traversing through, uh, 11,000 feet of terrain. That's only T to pin, not including the individual hole walks and then everything else that, and the walking back and forth when people are spraying all over fairways. It's just, it's just very, very difficult. Yeah. This particular weekend, I saw a lot of this in my cameras and that means when they do when when I see this in the cameraman, it means that we're splitting up, which means one person's on the left, one person's on the right. So be aware that the cameras are going to be on opposite sides of the fairway because at Nevin, everybody hits and everybody goes a different direction. So uh, the cameramen have like different hand signals depending on what's going on to help signal to me what's going on. Um, so I saw a lot of the, the devil horns this particular weekend. Uh, Mick or Mickey Nilsson says, good morning. Is this longer than normal? Yeah, our show is, is, we usually wrap up right around the three hour mark tonight. Here we are three hours and 45 minutes, but we're going to be wrapping up here soon. So it, depending on where you are, probably somewhere over in Europe, we're still rolling. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you. Is there a fiber line at the DOS house? I don't think it's, it's not a fiber line. I don't know exactly how good, but I know there is extended connection, uh, connectivity of, of a much higher speed than your standard, uh, house line. And I think there is also some redundancy built in with another form of internet connection there, which as we've said, you know, another huge advantage just for instance, me going there and us using that place is if you're at an Airbnb or you're at some other random place set up, if the booth internet goes down and that's how we're, you know, sharing everything with you guys, the booth internet goes down and you don't have a secondary internet service, 
built in, the, the booth is down. Like, mm -hmm. and that could be two minutes. That and could then, be two hours and 22 minutes. You don't yeah. know. So having some of those things built into a more stationary location is a, yet another advantage. Yeah. Because if say, there's something that can go wrong, it has at oh, some point yeah, in the last eight years. We, we've run through the gamut. At least we think we've run through the gamut of almost everything that's gone wrong, could go wrong at some point. Yeah, I was thinking, as you were saying that, being at like a Airbnb doing remote commentary and your internet goes out, you're not even in control of that. Internet account. service, yeah. yeah. You, you might not even know who, who it is. Like, oh, who's the internet provider in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, where we happen to be or something? You're like, I don't know, is it? Comcast, Cox, uh, HBC, Spectrum, Spectrum, Verizon. Just it could be anything, and then you can't even call because you're not the account owner. Yeah. You're just like, oh, like maybe I call the Airbnb host, but they're gonna be like, okay, dude. Yeah, it's eight thirty. I'm really, doing stuff. Really funny. And they get back to you at at two thirty in the afternoon. So. Yeah, there's there's a challenge there. Before we wrap up the show, I see uh, well one more thing with Brian and or Ray saying Brian Earhart needed to volunteer on Sunday. He had to push his own live view <laughs> card around. That is the first time I've seen Brian do that. I'm sure he's done it before, but he he you know some people keep it in a backpack. He had it in like a disc or a golf. Cart there's only one reason for that in front of him. It's because he was following the likes of Big Germ, who clearly didn't want to wear the backpack. So Germ, I think, had a Rovic card of sorts mm. and and forced the idea onto Brian <laughs> the first day Germ had joined us. And then by the second or final day, and when they had to split up, Germ, I'm sure, said, well, I'm taking my cart. And then Brian probably was like, well, this cart thing's not so bad. And probably. so then Brian, and then I'm Germ, I'm assuming, probably helped acquire yet another cart. Maybe he's got a backup cart. I don't know what he's doing these days. But um, yeah, and that's been said before, whether it's a cart or or I've had a few volunteers who have graciously carried it for me, or if there's some way to integrate a, a Zuka, you know, sponsorship, those are all possibilities of, uh, yeah, alternatives. But that that was completely infused uh, by one I, big germ. I would assume so. Who's but. used to pushing his stroller thing around. So, <laughs> stroller. Uh, I mean. It, it does look like a stroller. You push it a lot like a stroller, that's for sure. Uh, uh, Tom over there. I know you're, you're even uh, in East coast time, probably over in Michigan. Thanks. Thanks for joining along. I hope you're doing well, buddy. Good to see you. All right, guys. I think with that, we've answered most of the significant questions. You guys can argue another day about paywalls and, and advertising and money and sponsors. Um, my only suggestion would be if, if you, any of you think you can do it better, smarter, cheaper, easier, do please do. I, I think er everyone would love to see another option and another, um, uh, you know, team tackle it. But j just know that at the end of the day, a business has to be sustainable in some capacity. And it, it may not be the way you would do it, but you're also not running that business. Um, so that would be my encouragement to you to go out and prove anyone else wrong that you don't feel like they're doing it the right way. We're going to call it. We're going to thank you guys for joining us. It's been a long night. Most of you are still here with us, which is crazy. Some of you are just waking up on the other parts of the world. We love you and appreciate you guys all for tuning in uh, to the live show. Thank you to Ricky Waisaki who joined us earlier. Uh, we're kicking off the off season, so to speak, but we're going to have a ton of great guests, lots of people to catch up with, I'm sure, over the next few months. And then we'll also probably integrate some additional content or games or some other fun stuff Never that know. might unfold. Anything's possible. So you guys have a good night. Be safe. What did Ellen say? Take care. No. Ah, never mind. I never watched Ellen. I don't know. Well, it's because it was toxic over there. I didn't watch before it was toxic, nor after it was toxic. <laughs> it's toxic here. For Johnny V, I'm That's the Disc Golf Guy. Toxic. We'll see you <laughs> next week. Thank you for joining us for Smashbox TV. 476 is after show. We'll see you next week when you step inside the Smashbox.